number 10 is Bishop. Lucas Bishop is a mutant from the far flung dystopian possible future where Hope Summers wiped out millions of human beings resulting in the hunting and policing of mutants by sentinels under control of the government. From just this alone, his knowledge of possible future events, he has a large amount to offer. But Lucas Bishop also served as a member of the XSE mutant police force giving him a whole whack of experience using his abilities. Speaking of which, Bishop has the very useful mutant ability of energy absorption, allowing him to absorb the majority of types of energy including magic, sound, light, psionic, psychic and the list goes on and on, with no clearly defined limit as of yet. The energies he absorbs can be either environmental or directed towards him as attacks. He can then store or project that energy from his body in different ways, whether in the form of concussive blasts, energy rays, explosions, fire, plasma and again the list goes on and on. But his favorite use is by projecting the energy out of his XSE weaponry. The nature of his powers makes it difficult to damage him with energy based attacks and almost any attack to be honest, giving him nigh invulnerability. But it also enables him to work well with any energy using teammates. Bishop can also store the absorbed energy within his personal reserves whereupon the energy increases his strength, speed, stamina and healing abilities. He is highly underutilized especially recently and I think that's gotta change. Alright at number 9 is Polaris. Lorna Dane is not just a green scarlet witch, ok? In fact she is the real legit daughter of the anti hero magnetic powerhouse Magneto. She's been manipulated, used and been the victim of villains like Mesmero, Eric the Red, the Marauders, Zaladane and Apocalypse. But she has been a member of the X-Men and more recently is a key member of the newest version of the team. She's always been prominent but I think a little overlooked in comparison to others which is a shame. She's actually quite powerful. As the daughter of Magneto, Polaris actually has pretty much exactly the same abilities as him. She can control and manipulate magnetic fields allowing her to create force fields, fly on the earth's magnetic field, emit magnetic concussive pulses that can overload and short circuit electrical systems. She's able to manipulate the natural iron within the blood of living organisms allowing her to reverse the flow of an entire crowds blood in order to render them unconscious. She controls metal and magnetism just like her father but hasn't had as much experience so her potential has not been fully realized as of yet. Number 8 Forge. Forge has been an important member of the X-Men and mutant community for a long long time. But for some reason he always seems kind of unused, at least to me. He is almost like the X-Men's version of Q from James Bond. His mutant ability is that he is an intuitive genius. He can visually perceive mechanical energy quote unquote in action. He can just understand how something works by looking at it, as easily as breathing for example. This power allows Forge to instinctively know and understand the potential and functional operations of any machine or technological device in his visual range. It's a skill that that combined with his natural intelligence allows him to conceive, design and build mechanical devices and operate, modify and disassemble existing technology to create countermeasures for it. It's pretty cool. It's almost hard to explain how this is a power but it is. It's allowed him to subconsciously invent and construct something where someone else would have to think about it, design it and then create it. He's been able to just do it and then deconstruct it later to figure out how it actually works. He's created cybernetic systems, sophisticated holograms and elaborate computer and, and fiber optic systems as well as time travel devices. His potential is vast and that's before you take into account his magical affinity. And at number 7 is Dazzler. Dazzler, otherwise known as Allison Blair, is a mutant with the ability to transduce sound into light. She's also a very gifted singer and performer which she uses in tandem with her powers to just blow people's minds at her concerts. But she is more than that. She can take any source of sound other than her own voice. And unless it's projected back at her, as light energy which she stores up and can use in a bunch of really cool ways. Obviously using the lights she admits she can blind adversaries, but she can also create therapeutic light to help allies. Her dazzle blast, which is either the worst name ever or the best name ever, is a light show so intense it overwhelms the nervous system of whoever is watching and can knock people out. She can also shoot lasers that can cut through solid metal and photon blasts 
that strike with concussive force. She can create quote unquote light fog to hide allies. She can create force fields for offensive and defensive purposes and she can even fly. She has become the Herald of Galactus in a What If comic and she was actually one of the more impressive versions of Thor from God Doom's Thor Corps, even coming over to the 616 reality at one point. Dazzler is awesome and very underused. Coming in at number 6 is Mimic. As a child, a nosy and curious Calvin Rankin accidentally exposed himself to one of his father's experiments. Altering his body and triggering his powers, Calvin soon discovered he was able to mimic the abilities of others who were in his close proximity. He first appeared as an adversary to the original X-Men, copying and mimicking all their powers at once. After he reformed, he was offered a role on the team. Now, As a member of the X-Men, Mimic didn't really get along too well with his fellow teammates, but he was was one hell of a powerful asset to them and was responsible for a few of the team's victories. Cyclops resigned as leader shortly after Calvin joined and weirdly, Professor X chose to make Mimic the team's leader. Over time, other powers he has copied include the powers of Hulk, Banshee, Marrow, Gambit, Rogue, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Shadowcat, Baron, Megan, Kylan, Micromax, Rachel Summers, Wolfsbane, Pete Wisdom, Psylocke, Risque, Siren, Warpath, Sunspot, Cable, Caliban, Domino, Boom Boom, Richter, Cannonball, Shatterstar, Post, Blob, Mystique, Toad, members of the Crazy Gang, and so many others. The thing about Mimic in comparison to Sync or Rogue is that he copies skills and abilities as well as powers, and even Mimic's physical attributes which gives him a degree of more versatility at the cost of lower power levels. But he's still really cool. Number 5. Multiple Man Multiple Man has such a crazy interesting power. Okay, so I should say for starters that he isn't technically a mutant. Jamie or James Madrox is actually a changeling, which is a sort of genetic precursor for mutants who gain their abilities at birth instead of having their X gene activated later on. like in puberty or whatever. For James, his power is that of duplication. He can duplicate himself multiple times upon impact and each of his dupes can create one single dupe. One of the real benefits of his power though is that the prime Madrox will retain any memories of his dupes experiences. So let's say you had to read like 10 books in a week. Well, you could have like 10 dupes all read one book each, and then when they re-merge with you, you have all of their memories of each book. If that makes sense. Multiple Man is like an information gathering powerhouse. He can also use the ability to learn skills, like one of his dupes trained as a Shaolin monk and trained in meditation. One was a trained EMT, one audited an anatomy class for six months, one passed the New York bar exam, one claimed to be the world's greatest detective, and just stuff like that. In his self title coming from 2018, he even goes into a future world that is completely ruled by Madri, which is the plural for Jamie's dupes. I'd love to see his potential shown in the MCU or something, it would just be so entertaining. And at number four, Blink. Do you know in the beginning of the X-Men Days of Future Past live action movie when there's that really cool fight scene in the bunker between some mutants and the ultra advanced sentinels. Now you know that mutant that was firing out portals and stuff and doing all that jazz? That is Blink and she is so cool. Clarice Ferguson's power has a few different uses. Obviously there are the bright pink portals but she can also throw that same energy as a sort of missile that will teleport those or even parts of those that she hits. The range of her power is actually quite impressive as it has a potential range of as far as the moon and back which is Pretty freaking far, if you know. With the potential of her abilities and the cool way it is used, and even just how awesome it looks, you'd think she would have done a lot more, but she seems to not really have a whole lot of meaningful appearances. Except, if you want to see her being as amazing of a character as she should be, find her in Age of Apocalypse. So cool. Number 3, Firestar. Another pretty powerful mutant who just hasn't had any key moments to speak of. Angelica Jones, also known as Firestar, has the awesome mutant ability of microwave energy manipulation and generation. She uses the Earth's electromagnetic field and converts it into microwave radiation. She also absorbs microwave radiation from her environment and from stars in the galaxy. 
She can then focus this energy at targets or to do different things. She can set targets on fire, explode them, and even melt them. She is consistently keeping her powers in check because she has the potential to damage the entire Earth and its atmosphere with her abilities, which is why she is even more powerful in space, where she isn't limited by the fragility of the Earth. Out in the cosmos, she has been able to easily produce an attack that injured Garth and Saul when he possessed the energy of the entire Nova Corps. And she also used her abilities to power a massive Shi'ar interstellar transport gate with very, very little effort. She's even been able to disrupt the psionic powers of others using her own power. Most impressively, Emma Frost. She is still young and learning to use her powers, but she needs to be more than just one of Spider-Man's friends because she is a powerhouse of potential. And at number two is Husk. Paige Guthrie is part of a family that has a lineage of mutant abilities. Sam Guthrie, Cannonball, Joshua Guthrie, Icarus, Melody Guthrie, Arrow, and Jebediah Guthrie, who doesn't have a superhero name. Paige's power is a wee bit unorthodox though. She has the ability to shed her skin, and by concentrating on specific chemicals or elemental formulas, she can cause the layer of skin underneath to be a different element or shape or state. She can become any solid that she has studied and can imitate metal, diamond, granite, wood, rubber, and even glass. She's been shown to turn into a sharp toothed lizard once, which is weird. She doesn't have perfect control over her abilities at this point in time, but when she transforms, she obviously gains different abilities depending on what she turns into. She's granted herself super strength and durability, flame generation, and many other different things. Her shedding lets her get rid of dirt or sweat and even minor injuries, which is both cool and kind of a little freaky, but mm. she has all kinds of potential if she is given the time to properly train her powers. And in at number one, Megan or Megan or Megagan or however you want to say it. If you were a fan of Excalibur in the late 80s and early 90s, then you'll likely know who Megan is. That's with two G's. Megan is a unique character like most of the mutants are. She's a mutant empath with the ability to shapeshift but she is also an elemental of great power and she's even got a dose of fairy heritage. Her list of abilities is a little hard to define as it is with most shapeshifters and it can even be augmented by her connection with the earth. She is transformed into a Godzilla like dragon that could breathe fire and even a werewolf like creature with all the enhancements that can afford. Megan has also shown through her environmental connection and mutant empath abilities to be able to adapt to situations and also to the emotions of those around her. So for example, she can grow gills and fur, or become prettier when those around her think she is ugly. She can also turn into other superhumans as well, gaining their powers but with less potential, which even worked when she became a female version of the Silver Surfer, which is kind of nuts. She is resistant to reality warping powers and she even has a true form where she can manipulate elements, fly, and manipulate magical energies. She is a highly capable mutant and character, she just hasn't really done a heck of a lot since the 90s, and that's a shame. Coming in at number 10, it's Toad. Toad has been a member of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and by extension, a part of the mutant community for a hot minute. But in my opinion, Mortimer Toynbee hasn't really been utilized as much as he should be given his massive list of abilities. Toad has a degree of superhuman strength, specifically in his back and legs, which allow the little weirdo to jump around 25 to 37 feet, and he'll kick you so hard you ain't getting back up. He's got flexible bone structure, superhuman stamina, durability, reflexes, and agility. Toad, like a lot of super beings has a regenerative healing factor, but unlike a lot of mutants, he has UV vision, a super strong 30 foot prehensile tongue, acidic saliva, sticky paralytical resin out of his pores, and pheromone secretion. I can understand why he isn't exactly at the top of the mutant landscape, partially because he's kind of really gross and just overall unpleasant, but he does have a hell of a lot of abilities to offer. Number nine, Ricochet. Now, I don't know if this is cheating, because you slap some web shooters super strength and the ability to do everything a spider can on this mutant and you basically have Spider-Man. In fact, the superhero name and costume used by Jonathan Gallo was originally used by Peter Parker as a secondary superhero identity when Spider-Man was framed for ending someone's life. But enough about Webhead. Jonathan Gallo is a mutant with the abilities of superhuman agility and reflexes, with his agility allowing him to jump long distances and when he combines his powers, he can almost bounce off walls in a sort of 
I don't know, ricocheting type movement? But that's not all. Ricochet also has another mutation in the form of his danger sense, which is totally not the same as spider sense, except it sort of is. It allows Jonathan to sense danger before it happens. Now with his agility, reflexes, and danger sense, this mutant possesses three of Spider-Man's more useful abilities, but he's just different and cool enough that I can still respect him as more than some cheap knockoff. Number eight, Lifeguard. Lifeguard, or Heather Cameron, arguably has one of the most useful mutant powers possible. Her ability is called Danger Detection Response, and basically what it means is that she can detect danger to her or others' lives in her vicinity, and she can literally evolve whatever powers are necessary for her to stop those lives from being lost. She can gain more than one power at a time and is able to control said powers after just a few seconds. It also seems to be kind of limitless in what she can do. Her situation, biomorphic at Adaptations have taken the form of growing wings for flight, extra arms for carrying and super strength, her skin turning into a sort of golden metallic super awesome armor, gills for underwater breathing with her legs even turning into a fish tail for a better swimming ability, as well as simply upping her strength level from normal to superhuman. It's almost too fitting that she was an actual lifeguard before her powers emerged. She's a literal lifesaver. Number seven, Forearm. Michael McCain is the mutant under the name Forearm, an exceedingly clever name as this mutant's ability is that forearm has four arms. Oh boy. Alongside his four arms ability, forearm also has access to super strength, stamina, and durability. Because honestly, forearms isn't exactly going to save him in the majority of mutant conflicts. That being said though, I would kill to have two extra arms. I just can't help but imagine how useful that would be. Add to the fact that your arms are super strong, not only can you make a peanut butter jelly sandwich while texting your friends and petting a cat or something, but you can also trade two extra fists worth of punches with some heavy hitting mutants who only get two hands. For Michael, when his powers are used in unison with his extra limbs, he is a formidable close combat specialist, able to hold his own against some of X-Men's own powerhouses like Rockslide. He was a founding member of the Mutant Liberation Front and he is now happily living on Krakoa. Number six. Nature Girl. Although Lin Lee started off at Jean Grey's school for higher learning, after she witnessed some of the horrible things humanity is doing to the earth and to nature, she would instead become an eco fighting back against humanity, which makes sense given her powers. Nature Girl's powers are directly connected to the natural world, so she can communicate, influence, manipulate, and control nature, living beings, except I guess not humans or mutants, plants, natural phenomena like the weather and geology of the earth, and the matter and energy of which all these things are composed of. Now that statement alone kind of encompasses a lot of different stuff. She can call upon animals and ally herself with them. She can make plants grow, move, and attack people. She can control the weather to a degree and heal nature to a degree too. She was on the run from Wolverine for a while and was able to get away from him a few times using her abilities. And she looks totally awesome wielding the Krakoan cudgel with her big antlers and the goat legs and stuff. Super cool. Number five, Miranda. The only reason this character is on this list is because a lot of people have not heard of her. She doesn't even have a last name. Miranda had powers that appeared at first to be cosmic level reality warping. Warping on a level the beast created the term Omicron level mutant to call her. He thought she was able to manipulate reality while somehow completely avoiding any damage to space or time. Like when she has stopped the juggernaut in his path by making a well appear right below him that he was falling down millions of miles. But what Miranda's mutant power actually was, was control over all of Marvel's continuity. She is the one who has been keeping all of Marvel's mutants young. She's the reason the old Nick Fury got replaced by Samuel L. Jackson, and she's the reason Bucky Barnes came back as the Winter Soldier. Soldier. At least, she is in this alternate universe of Earth TRN656, the one from X-Men Worst X-Man Ever. I'm just kind of curious to see if this ultra-powerful mutant will ever show up in other stories or even the 616 universe at all. Number four, Banshee. Sean Cassidy has been around for one heck of a long time in the world of Marvel's mutant community, and he has done some pretty prominent things, but his power doesn't seem like it's all that impressive, and he is kind of looked over when thinking about the mutants, but he shouldn't be. Sean has acoustic kinesis, an ability he does many, many cool things with. Primarily 
apparently, Sean emits a sonic scream. Now, the sound waves from this sonic scream have shattered solid objects, cracked skulls, and even liquefied people. But he has done so much more with this ability. He can ride the sound waves he creates using his suit to be able to fly at subsonic speeds. He can create sonar by sending out a pure signal note and listening to the returning sound. He can tighten the sound waves around himself and others to create sonic shields. And more than that though, he has been shown to affect the fluid inside people's ears with his sonic screams being able to set them off balance and even render them unconscious. One ability that had me raising an eyebrow is the fact that Banshee can even subtly influence people's subconscious mind by changing the tones and vibrations of his voice, effectively using hypersonic suggestions and persuasive abilities. Don't sleep on Banshee people. Number 3 North Star John Paul Bobier is an interesting mutant with a few different abilities. North Star's main ability is super speed. Not really in the traditional sense of running really fast though. North Star can propel his body at superhuman speed becoming a living projectile, channeling a portion of the kinetic energy of his body's molecules in a single direction. It's even possible for him to reach 99% the speed of light in a vacuum. But if he were to do it on Earth or something, he'd not only damage himself but could quite possibly break the planet. He can also super speed any part of his body giving him superhuman reflexes and an incredibly fast metabolism to heal wounds. What's really cool is that since he is taking atomic motion from the muscles, his muscles become closer making him superhumanly durable, allowing him to survive moving at the speeds he does without tearing himself apart. He also uses his ability to fly by projecting the kinetic energy downwards which in turn lifts him upwards. Northstar used this ability to basically cheat as an Olympic skier which is kind of really unfair but whatever. And we haven't even talked about his photokinesis and concussive blasts yet and we're not going to so moving on. Number 2 Sage Sage is a super genius with a brain more powerful than any computer in the world, granting her perfect memory and rapid analytical abilities. She can come up with the perfect plan in an instant, learn just about any skill without having to practice it, remember everything she's ever experienced, perform multiple tasks at once by allocating a partition of her brain to each task, and thanks to training with Professor X, she can engage in telepathy. Her telepathic abilities allow her to detect minds and read them, project thoughts, astral projection, cast realistic mental illusions, and she even has a kind of psionic defense unique to her called her firewall. But it doesn't even stop there, as Sage even has some biokinetic abilities as well, including reading another mutant or person's genetic code and DNA, being able to literally see who someone's related to, jump starting latent or enhancing current mutant abilities, and has complete control over her physical body, being able to expel nanobots from her body by controlling her immune system, almost like highly advanced antivirus. She needs more time in the spotlight, like desperately. And in at number one is Negasonic Teenage Warhead. You may remember Ellie Fimister as the super angsty Negasonic Teenage Warhead from the Ryan Reynolds Deadpool movies. And while that character was both hilarious and awesome, she's kind of pretty different in the comics. Obviously she is still a teenager with that ridiculous yet awesome name, but her powers seem to be vastly different. Ellie's powers are psychically based and primarily take the form of precognitive night nightmares and premonitions, meaning she sees the future. Specifically, she saw disasters before they happened, which kind of explains the heightened teenage angst thing. But she would go on to start having glimpses of danger in the near future, which allows her to plan ahead or avoid attacks. She also possesses other psychic abilities like telepathy, telekinesis, and has been able to levitate. But maybe strongest of all is her abilities of reality warping and particle manipulation and absorption. Plus, some of the superhuman starter pack abilities including strength speed, durability, and reflexes, as well as just being an awesome character partially due to her texting movie counterpart. In at number 10 is Beltane. Beltane is a mutant you may likely not have heard of. Her real name is currently unknown, but we know she was part of a group of Romani gypsies. She was captured by the Latvian monarch and awesome supervillain Dr. Doom and experimented on, which activated her latent mutant abilities, and also set off her desire to overthrow his rule with a group of other escapees. Now Beltane's ability is the secret
secret weapon of her group. She has the ability of fear projection, which means that she can physically project a manifestation of whatever the person she is facing most fears, psychically messing with and almost torturing her victims. So when fighting Wolfsbane, for example, Beltane made the hero see a projection of her not so nice father. Probably a mistake as Wolfsbane eventually took her down in an animalistic rage, but hey, it's still a cool power. Coming in at number 9. Wolfsbane. Speaking of Wolfsbane, Rain Sinclair has the mutant ability that I wish I had when I was a kid. She can turn herself into a wolf at will and can even go into a transitional form that is basically a close to a werewolf without being a werewolf type of thing. In fact, she is basically a werewolf, but with none of the drawbacks of the monster. She retains all her faculties, minus not being able to talk and just being a little bit feral, and is not forced to change only at night. Rain grows much larger than her human form when she changes and gains access to some enhanced strength, which coupled with the body of a wolf, grants her enhanced speed and reflexes as well. She gains heightened senses similar to a wolf. The thing with Wolfsbane is that she is both a wolf and a human, so she gains the benefits of both, like almost stacking on top of each other. Unlike wolves, or humans for that matter though, she does have an enhanced healing factor and enhanced vision as well. So double thumbs up. Number 8. Abigail Brand Abigail here is an interesting character. She is technically a human-alien hybrid, as her father hails from the planet Axis. But it's actually her human mother who Brand inherited her mutant abilities from that allowed her to join S.H.I.E.L.D. and then S.W.O.R.D. as an agent and hero. So what are said abilities? Well, she has a form of pyrokinesis known as tactile pyrokinesis, which means that Bran can coat at least her hands in flames that are potent enough to burn through most metals via tactile contact. She can use her abilities to warm up others, but has enough control that she can also set others on fire. So she has some versatility with set abilities. I somewhat kind of prefer her form of pyrokinesis because, I don't know, I just swear there are way too many fire based heroes who seem to all do similar things. So at least Abigail has her own brand of fire. Sorry, the dad jokes are in full force today. Number 7. Primal Adam Berman first appeared in X-Men Unlimited number 16 in July 1997, and his story arc was one I actually had a good time reading. It was oddly unique. At least to me. Adam is a mutant, but his ability is a transformative one, and he can easily hide it, which allowed him to kind of play himself off as a non mutant even though he was trying to join the Xavier Institute. That's what I gathered, at least. It was kind of confusing. So you should read his story, but we are here for his abilities, not his story. And those said abilities almost remind me of other super powered beings like the Hulk and even the Lizard, because Adam can transform into a totally primal reptilian like form, growing about 50% bigger than his normal self and gaining red glowing eyes. But his physical enhancements are quite impressive. His strength boosts to around a level 10, with the highest level being a 100. But level 1 super strength is capable of pressing 800 pounds through a 25 ton range, so level 10 is nothing to scoff at. Look, just just go read his story, okay? Number 6. Adam X. Another Adam! Almost like I liked that name or something. Hmm. Adam Nuramani is honestly a bit more interesting than the last Adam though. He was a genetically created hybrid of both Emperor Deken of the Shi'ar Empire and Catherine Summers of Earth, created in an attempt to introduce more genealogies to the Shi'ar Empire. Now just as his origin is unique, so are his powers. Adam has the ability of electrokinetic hymopyrokinesis, or if you don't want to hurt yourself like I just did, you can also say sanguine combustion, which also sounds super Super cool. It basically means that he can send an electric surge through oxygenated blood, which leads to ignition of the electrolytes present in said blood, causing a person to burn from the inside out, which could result in a little subtle warming effect, or it could completely disintegrate a person. So there's a lot of wiggle room here, which is cool. But thanks to his Shi'ar side of things, he also has enhanced strength, agility, reflexes, stamina, speed, vision, and healing. So couple all that with his awesome fighting skills and the cool cybernetic retractable claws, and Extreme is someone you don't want to mess with. Coming in at number 5 is Shatterstar. So I was like 
this close to including Longshot on this list, but he doesn't even consider himself a mutant, and there's a whole bunch of weird time mojo verse stuff going on, so instead, I'm going to do his father and or son, which is a whole other thing in itself. Look, all you need to know is we're talking about Shatterstar. Gavidra 7 learned the arts of battle as a warrior in arenas on Mojo World, where he developed both a sense of honor and incredible fighting skill, but those aren't his abilities. He possesses a large superhero starter pack. Superhuman strength, speed, agility, stamina, durability, senses, reflexes, agility, dexterity, coordination, balance, plus a regenerative healing factor, and even enhanced learning ability. Curiously though, he actually has hollow bones, which makes him a shim lighter than you would think he is, but also further boosts up his natural physical skills. The cool part of Shatterstar though are his Mojoverse swords, which he can use through his mutant ability to channel powerful vibratory shockwaves, which can be absolutely devastating, but also kind of drains him of energy. But after his mojo time, he can now create X-shaped portals as well that have to be linked to another person who acts as an anchor for said portals. These also drain him of energy, and he has a cooldown of about like four days before he can do it again, because this powerhouse needs some kind of balancing. Number four, Aurora. In the last part of this series, we talked about North Star, but that mutant has a sister. And guess what? Surprisingly, the mutant gene runs in the family. That shouldn't be surprising, really, because genes and all that. Hmm. Wow, this is a horrible intro. Janine Marie Bobier, otherwise known as Aurora, can generate a bright light, which according to the wiki is equivalent to half a million foot candles. Or if you aren't weird, it's about as strong as a lighthouse light, which is also an extremely weird frame of reference, but I digress. She and her brother can both do this by varying the rate of acceleration of the molecules of their bodies out of phase with one another, thereby generating a cascade of photonic discharges. The light can actually do some interesting things, like she can make a calming light that can even interrupt psychic control, or she can make concussive light blasts. Or, which is even cooler, she can even create lightning blasts that actually do some considerable damage. Like her brother, she can also move incredibly fast, and thanks to her molecular manipulation, she can also be extremely durable, heal quickly, and even withstand all the g-force of moving so fast without doing those insane weird breathing exercises that pilots have to do. Number three, Phantom X. I honestly kind of dread talking about Phantom X, but I also completely love this guy. When I first read a comic with him in it, I did not fully understand his power, and I still don't really, so now I'm gonna try and explain something to you that I do not fully understand myself. Cool? Cool. So basically, Phantom X, or Charlie Cluster 7, or Weapon 13, or John Philippe, if that's what you want to call him, was experimented on by Weapon Plus and was genetically grown and evolved using Sentinel technology. Thanks to this, he actually has, or had, three brains for independent parallel processing, nanoactive blood, and his primary nervous system is actually a detachable techno-organism called EVA, or EVA. So there's some stuff to unpack there. EVA, or EVA, can fly herself and can generate bioelectric charges to be used as weapons, with Phantom X being both telepathically and symbiotically linked to Eva. His multiple brains allow him to think like a sort of supercomputer similar to Sage, but it also gives him access to two extra personalities, a charmer and a super deadly mutant hunter. He can create extremely powerful illusions and can enter a trance state where he can rapidly heal, and his self-supremacy over his body and mind allows him to overcome pretty much anything to complete his mission, including mind control. I can't talk too too much more about him without taking forever, but know that he has enhanced senses, is a dope fighter, and does not create any kind of smell. Please look into this character and try to make sense of him, because I need help. Number two, Somnus. Carl Valentino is actually a new member of Earth's Mutants, first appearing in Marvel's Voices Pride number one in June 2021. But canonically, he's been around for a while. He and Dakin actually had a one-night stand in 1967, a one-night stand in which Dakin or Dakin 
Dakin dreamt of them having an entire life together, which caused Dakin to retrieve Carl's body in the modern day and bring it to Krakoa for revival. Except this dream was caused by Carl himself. That's because Somnus has the mutant power of one romancy, which I'm almost certain I mispronounced, but I'm kind of proud of myself that I think I didn't. This means he has the ability to enter, broadcast, and even control dreams at will. He can render his opponents unconscious and is also able to bring others into his dreamscape. It's such a unique and interesting power, and it can allow him to live entire lifetimes within a dream, which in my nerd mind tells me he can learn and improve upon skills while dreaming, but don't take my word on that, I just kind of made that up. Only time will tell the multitude of ways his power shall be used in the future. And finally, at number one is WizKid, a computer genius and novice inventor, Takashi Taki Matsuya kind of has an unfair advantage in the inventor game. That's because WizKid here has the ability to technoform materials and rearrange parts of things to function to his specifications, even to the point of being contrary to the laws of nature and science. And he's even recently learned how to manipulate plants and even other mutant powers to create new technology. With this ability comes a natural psionic aptitude for seeing how components can work together, which lets him make things work even better using his mutant powers. Power. As for the using of other mutant abilities, it basically means he can see the use of individual mutant powers as components, coming together as a larger machine, or even being able to guide the linking and combination of mutant powers to work collaboratively together. So he's almost like a power strategist, which is really cool, on top of the awesome technology he can already create. All this basically comes together to make WizKids someone you would absolutely want on your side, wheelchair and all. Number 10, Vanisher. Vanisher actually has the mutant ability of teleportation, but Unlike mutants like Nightcrawler, Vanish's teleporting ability is completely psionic in nature and actually causes him to go through a series of extra dimensional portals. But he does it so quickly he didn't even realize that was what he was doing. There is actually an instant where he tries to explore his powers more and stops his teleportation part way through, ending up trapped in the dark force dimension by its inhabitants. Vanish can also use his ability to bring a certain amount of mass other than himself with him when he teleports. which in one case allowed him to teleport himself and about eight others from Southern California to Genosha. To add to that, Vanisher can actually also teleport any part of his body, kind of like how the Spot did it, but he does it so little that it's almost kind of not worth mentioning. Number nine, Tag. Brian Cruz, the mutant known as Tag, has the awesome ability called the Pariah Effect. Now this ability allows Brian to psionically tag a target, causing that person to emit a psionic signal that could make everyone or even a select group of people in an area either run away from or run towards and dogpile on top of the selected target, or who he likes to call it. The distance of this game of tag was about 100 feet, and everyone affected by the ability, excluding the one tagged, was fully aware of what they were doing while not being able to control their own actions. It's such an interesting ability, and it's fun as well because he can also tag a target with the effect of having that person run away from themselves, so they would just be uncontrollably running until he cancelled the effect. He was part of the group called the Helians until he lost his power on M-Day and passed away in a missile attack shortly after. Afterwards. But luckily, Tag was resurrected on Krakoa, and hopefully, we will get to see him use his abilities again at some point. Number eight, Hijack. Marvel's mutant David Bond actually has absolutely nothing to do with British 007s. Instead, David is the mutant known as Hijack with the technopathic ability to assume control over vehicles. It's kind of so oddly specific, and it makes me wonder if the ability works for things like bicycles or like scooters or something. This power gives me more questions than answers, to be perfectly honest. Look, he's controlled buses to ram into Sentinels, and he's even been able to control an entire shield helicarrier, and even a fleet of them at one point, which is definitely no small feat of its own. His abilities have even allowed David to control technological suits of armor, but curiously, he couldn't control Sentinels. Now, while his power could be used in quite a lot of different ways, David wasn't always the most useful of characters, so we didn't get a whole ton of him to analyze. Number seven, Manifold. Originally, Manifold was thought to be a teleporter, but his powers are 
much more than just teleportation. Eden actually has the ability to communicate with the universe and kind of ask it for certain things. And in turn, the universe would change and mold to do what he wanted. So for teleportation, for example, he's actually kind of creating the Einstein Rosen bridge and folding space to allow himself or whatever he wants to be teleported from wherever he is to wherever he wants. It's the same thing when he creates portals. He's used the ability to fold space around him to make him appear invisible and he can even fold space around beings and things. Like when he teleported a bit of the sun's plasma to his hand and folded space around it so it wouldn't be able to hurt him, which is a crazy thought. Even though this ability only works in his native reality, it seems like potentially an incredibly powerful ability. Number six, La Bandera. First appearing in Wolverine Volume 2, number 19, in the December of 1989, La Bandera is said to be the daughter of a supporter of Fidel Castro, and her mutant ability is basically to be an awesome leader, which in turn apparently powers her secondary mutation. So her first mutation is as an empath, able to influence the emotions of others, which she mainly used to inspire people to fight against oppression. And then in turn, the amount of followers she had would power her energy projection powers, which she would channel through her staff. So so if she has no followers, then there's no energy projection. But if she's using her empath abilities properly, then she should always have followers, right? She began fighting dealers, who she followed to the South American country of Tierra Verde, which at that point was ruled by a harsh and corrupt dictator. She teamed up with Wolverine to fight the dictator, but unfortunately she passed away at the hands of Zeitgeist in 1995 and hasn't really been talked about since, like at all. Number 5. Blindfold it's interesting that Blindfold wears a blindfold, as she was born with no eyes or eye sockets for her to blind with a fold. But don't think being unable to see is some kind of handicap. Blindfold is wildly powerful. Blindfold's powers are psychically based and are strongest in telepathy and wielding astral energy, which she can make solid to do a number of things including creating armor, weapons, force fields, and energy blasts, and using it to cast her astral projections into the physical world. Using her telepathy, sometimes in conjunction with the astral plane and its energies, Ruth is capable of astral travel, psychometry, precognition, retrocognition, clairvoyance, psychic possession, mental influence, and she even has some chaos manipulation. She also has a degree of telepathic resistance, meaning telepaths can't read her mind, but they can still possibly attack it and possess it and all that fun stuff. And in at number four is Destiny. After talking about Ruth, it seems like a logical shift to talk about her possible great-grandmother, Irene Adler. Irene Adler, otherwise known as Destiny as a mutant, has a long history going all the way back to the 19th century, and she was even in a relationship with Mystique all the way back when. While she has her eyes, unlike Blindfold, Irene is indeed physically blind. But it's okay as she could still see the future. That's because Destiny has the mutant power of precognition, able to mentally scan the probability spectrum of alternate futures and by concentrating, she could focus on only the most probable alternate futures. She could scan the alternate futures that existed from one second away up until those that existed 15 minutes away, but she could be 97% accurate if her predictions were 10 seconds away or less, allowing her to basically see what she was doing even though she couldn't see what she was doing. Number 3. Exodus this character is one a lot of you may actually know is pretty powerful, as he does have a seat on the Krakoan Quiet Council, and is insanely capable. Exodus actually began as Grand Duke Benet du Paris in the 12th century as a nobleman hailing from the medieval France. He was sent to fight in the Crusades in the Holy Lands, and on his journey out there, that's when his mutant powers awoke. And he even gained further enhancements from the mutant apocalypse, becoming one of his champions before being entombed until the modern era. When and Magneto awoke him and teamed up with him. He is one of the most powerful mutants alive. He is an Omega level psionic, using the abilities of telepathy, telekinesis, teleportation, and empathy. His level of telekinesis is so fine tuned that he can even use it to manipulate things on the molecular and subatomic scales, allowing him to disassemble or reassemble complex devices, explosively even, and he's even been able to do this gaining control over electrons in an atom. He can create force fields, concussive blasts, electrons, electromagnetic blasts and fly at speeds of around Mach 2. But he further uses his telekinesis to enhance his strength, speed, and reflexes to an impressive degree, as well as using his abilities to heal himself and others, resurrecting and fixing the atoms that make up our bodies. And that's all alongside his other abilities including enhanced durability, longevity, healing factor, and a psionic vampirism. Number 2. Cosmar 
When Tashi Rapina first showed up in 2020, her mutant powers caused a little bit of a problem. Tashi has Wanarik reality warping, essentially meaning her dreams branch out and affect the reality around her, trapping her and whoever is around in the dreams. Now, People trapped in there can be physically or telepathically affected by these abilities. So for example, when she was having a nightmare, some guards discovered her and were turned into monsters by her abilities, but it only added to the fuel of her nightmare, making things a lot more worse. Her abilities can also show others their dreams or fears. It took Wildside using their abilities to make Tashi's nightmares into a pleasant dream to free those who had been trapped inside. It's a bonkers power and its emergence affected her physically too, which led her on a mission to try and find a way to look more human again. But her ability is definitely one of the more unique ones I've seen, with those who become trapped in her dreams being connected in one neural network with Tashi and used as a power source. Number 1. Danny Moonstar Okay, a bunch of you guys mentioned Danny Moonstar in the comments of the last part, as there was a mutant that had a similar shtick. But Danny's powers are much much more advanced than those of Beltane. While Beltane can create illusions of people's fears, Danny's powers only started here. But now she can create three dimensional images of certain visual concepts from thoughts and emotional impressions within the minds of either herself or others. It used to be just fears, but then it moved on to deepest desires, and then as she grew, so too did her power to allow her to create images from thoughts and less intense emotions. So, as an example, as this actually happened, say Danny and Cannonball walk into a high class hotel dressed casually. So to blend in, Danny used the image of what a well dressed hotel guest would look like from the mind of the desk clerk and disguised both herself and her teammate in those images. She could do this with multiple people at once as well, creating illusions that were almost real to the person whom they belonged. But with a little help from Professor X, she was able to create an image that was physically tangible. That's her potential, but so far it's only happened the one time. Normally her power is used more as a psychological tool or trick, but it's not her only only thing. Having powers that are psionic in nature, she can actually focus her powers into energy arrows which can stun someone by disrupting their central nervous system or force them to relive a traumatic memory. And as she grew, these arrows became more capable of physical harm. Coming in at number 10 is Sync. Sync has the mutant ability of power mimicry, meaning like Rogue, Sync can copy the powers of other mutants. Unlike Rogue, Sync has the benefit of not doing harm to whoever he is borrowing powers from and he can also do without physical touch. Recently though, after being resurrected, Sync got a bit of a power boost, and he may even become a new Omega level mutant. In the story, Sync not only uses his normal mutant powers to replicate the abilities of the mutants Sunfire and Cyclops while they were both nearby, but is also able to tap into Jean Grey's telekinetic abilities while she is literally all the way chilling on Mars. Sync's growth in power post resurrection was first noticed back in 2021's X-Men number 18 with Sync documenting that he was now able to sync not just with mutants, but other superhumans as well, which is quite the boost, and I think it just keeps going up and up and up. In the House of M alternate reality, Sync even got to the point of permanently retaining others' powers, which would be an incredible significant power boost as well. As a main member of the X-Men though, it's kinda hard to be surprised he's getting power boosts, so. At number 9 is iBoy. iBoy is usually undervalued because he looks really silly. And I get it. He does look like if the drummer for Kings of Leon had 57 eyes. But you should never judge a book by its cover because although iBoy doesn't look very menacing and seems rather confused most of the time, he's actually got a pretty good power set. He's got the ability to see just about anything, no matter how small and no matter how far. But on top of his microscopic and telescopic vision, he can also see basically every light wave there is, including X-ray, infrared, and thermal, among many others, including the magical plane as well. He also has night vision and even chemical detection. That's right, he can see pheromone secretions from people, giving him a tracking ability as well. iBoy is just one of those sad cases where he's just too unsettling looking to really garner much respect for who he really is and what he's truly capable of. Number 8. Domino Nina Thurman is a mutant weapons expert and mercenary. Under the name Domino, she was introduced in the early 90s as a member of X-Force. Domino is a survivor of a bunch of unethical scientists who are trying to create the perfect weapon. Tail is old this time, really. But this means Domino has all the talents and skills you would expect of an expert mercenary or secret agent. 
But we're here to talk about powers, and dominoes are unique to say the least. Domino has probability manipulation powers, meaning she is almost always lucky. She exudes, at all times, a subconsciously activated field that alters the probability of occurrences in her line of sight in her favor. This means that whenever she is stressed, excited, or focused on something, things will go improbably well for her, and quite poorly for her opponents. Now there is a caveat to this. She needs to actively be trying to help herself for her power to work. So like, if debris is falling from the sky and was about to hit her on the head, she would still be hurt if she just stood still. But if she she tried to avoid that debris, she would move perfectly to avoid each and every piece about to hit her. Now the full potential of Domino's abilities hasn't actually been fully realized yet. And Marvel has a knack for updating powers whenever they want. But with an ability to be lucky, there's only a finite amount of things you can't do. At number 7 we've got Forget Me Not. Forget Me Not might also be a case of people judging a book by its cover because he doesn't really look too menacing if we're being honest. But to be fair, his powers do also sound pretty lame at face value so it could be that. Basically this mutant can't be remembered by anyone he meets once he's out of sight. And as sad as this must be for him in his personal life, Forget Me Not can use this power to his advantage in a huge way in the right circumstances. In one case he's even able to dupe all of X-Force when the team has to form an elaborate plan just to track him down. They're only able to finally catch him by having Dr. Nemesis record himself explaining to the team the existence of Forget Me Not as they search for him. And they keep watching it over and over again on their coffee breaks. And the only caveat to this whole situation is that the maintenance bots along with I'm assuming any computer automated system can remember Forget Me Not. Which sort of weakens the potential for his powers in a way. So although he's more powerful than you might think, he's still got some vulnerabilities, but heck, everyone does, right? Forget me not. Number 6. Dust. Created by Grant Morrison and Ethan Van Skyver for 2002's new X-Men number 133, Soraya Kadir is a young Muslim mutant who's enrolled in the Xavier Institute for Higher Learning. Now, she has largely been just a background character in the story she shows up in, but Dust has been present for some of the largest events in recent X-Men history. Soraya was even one of the mutants who kept their powers after M-Day. Soraya is usually a pretty shy and quiet girl, but don't let that fool you. Her powers are no joke. Dust is able to transform into a cloud of sand or dust and even act as a violent sandstorm, literally stripping the flesh from her opponents. When she couldn't properly control her powers yet, Dust even unintentionally flayed two men alive after unleashing her power in an act of self-defense. Dust has also been shown to use her power internally, meaning like inside another person, entering her enemy's lungs and eroding them from the inside out, which is just a lovely thought. But wait, there's more. It also appears that Dust is immune to magic and telepathy based attacks in her sand form. The only problem is that if you pull out a hose or like a super soaker or something, she's pretty much done as she's extremely vulnerable to water. She's a powerful mutant, but sorely underutilized. At number 5 we have Mero. I've covered this mutant in almost every one of my lists for the last few weeks now and for good reason. She is just such an underappreciated mutant considering how versatile and honestly cool her powers are. And if you are a Mero diehard fan you know that she's had some difficulties with her powers which might explain part of the reason why people tend to write her off. Initially, Mero is unable to control the growth of her bones, which leaves her with some pretty painful and frankly terrifying looking struggles. But these days, she's honed her powers and has become quite impressive as a result. Her extreme bone growth allows her to eject super durable spikes from her skin and then she can use them as weapons. She is adept at hand to hand combat so this paired with her ability to literally grow her own weapons and then heal up without issue makes her pretty unstoppable. Number 4 Jubilee Jubilee's energy plasmoids might actually be one of the most potent of the X-Men's arsenal. The plasmoids aren't fireworks even though they look a hell of a lot like them. They're actually closer to superheated plasma. She can create a bolt of bright light but she can also push out enough power to bend steel or destroy a tree and with precision can even detonate microbursts inside someone's brain. So that's the amount of range we're talking about here. 
but that ain't all. It goes even beyond that. As Jubilee's Generation X instructor, Emma Frost, once speculated, if wielded properly, Jubilee could detonate objects on a subatomic level, meaning this unassuming mall rat can cause explosions of atomic proportions. She's a highly underrated character in the comics and gained a lot of popularity in the 90s thanks to the X-Men TV show. And while she's gone in and out of having powers, she still remains one of the cooler characters in the X-Men's lineup. At number three is Morph. Morph might sometimes be underestimated because of his funny disposition and his somewhat harmless look. With one of the best personalities out of all the mutants in my opinion, Kevin Sidney uses humor to work through his internal issues after his mother's death. But externally speaking, he deals with his other issues using his totally underrated power set. Morph is a master shapeshifter, capable of changing his body and his voice to mimic those of others. Not to mention, he's also able to fly at speeds of 40 miles per hour and has a healing factor due to his ability to manipulate the makeup of his molecules. But what's coolest about his powers is that if he chooses to grow more muscles, his strength will actually increase along with his appearance. And even if he can't get his strength up to match his opponent, his defensive stats are insane due to his ability to absorb the impact of any physical projectiles by simply allowing them to pass through him. Number two, Gambit. Gambit has the really cool mutant ability of molecular acceleration, allowing him to convert the potential energy of a non-living object through touch and kinetically excite the molecules to the point that they explode. Usually when a mutant has an ability that manipulates molecules, they have a pretty vast array of powers. But for Gambit, he mainly uses his abilities as attacks, charging up his signature playing cards and bow staff. But in an alternate universe, there is a future variation of Gambit known as New Sun, who is what Gambit would be if he reached the full potential of his power. He can manipulate kinetic energy down to a molecular level, meaning New Sun can charge objects and living beings without being in contact with them. He can stop objects that are in motion and make still objects begin moving. He can turn into a wave of energy, letting him travel through space and other dimensions, and he was even able to defeat the Dark Phoenix in his own universe by himself. We do see 616 Gambit use a lot of the same abilities as New Sun in a fight between the two in Gambit's 1999 solo series. But just knowing the potential this awesome Cajun sensation can reach, ooh, it's spicy. At number one is Chamber. Chamber is another underrated mutant with a power set that isn't quite appreciated the way it should be. It may have something to do with the trauma that Jonathan Starsmore goes through to acquire his powers, and further, how that experience hinders him from achieving certain goals that other, more accomplished mutants are able to. Basically, Chamber has what's described as a furnace of psionic energy stored in his chest. And when his powers are first discovered, this energy explodes out of him, destroying the lower half of his mouth and blowing a hole in his chest cavity, forcing him into intensive surgery to reconstruct the lost body parts. Eventually, he hones his powers to a point where he can aim psionic blasts on command, which is kind of like Cyclops, except in this case it's coming out of a hole in his chest. But what's more is is that Chamber later learns that he's in fact a descendant of Apocalypse, and he is eventually properly reconstructed by Clan Akaba in the appearance of Apocalypse. Although this leads him into a depression, Chamber then gets a huge power boost from this modification and changes his name to Decibel before joining the New Warriors. Jean Grey exists in a kind of gray area here. There's only so many secondary mutations out there, please be kind. Jean Grey has the Phoenix, but this ain't about them. This is about the time she she lost her powers and then got them back. Miss Grey absorbed Psylocke's telepathy and lost her telekinesis, but not for long, she just got it back. And there wasn't an explanation, so Beast just made the connection that it must have been her secondary mutation, and he would know. Amanda gets into Beast's secondary mutation in part one, go check it out if you haven't yet. Back to Jean. But what does the mutation that she gets mean for her and even other mutants? It potentially means she can restore her powers and come back from 
anything, and maybe even repowered, depowered X-Men. Of course, that's really up for debate, so let me know what you think down below. Cyberine, unfortunately, not a ship name for Cyclops and Wolverine. Instead, it's the name of the Wolverine version that killed Cyclops. Do I see an enemies to lovers plotline in the future? Wouldn't that be wild considering the whole Jean Grey thing? That is so not important. Anyway, so on Earth 517, that's the Marvel Contest of Champions Earth, Wolverine kills Cyclops. Hurting a friend to that extent is traumatic, and the psychological aftermath of it all caused Wolverine to experience a secondary mutation. This mutation allegedly was or was mimicking Cyclops' powers. So now we have a Wolverine with all his regular bells and whistles that also basically has laser eyes. New fear unlocked. Richard Gill of Earth 616 is better known as Wildside. He was a founding member of MLF, the Mutant Liberation Front. They are not good guys. His original mutation was hallucinations. He did this likely through telepathy and he was pretty good at it. Unfortunately for him, he was depowered after M Day. But hey, he survived, and that counts for something. He did eventually get his special talent back through the Mother Vine thing, plus a couple bonuses that made him an even bigger problem than before. They made his powers the same, but better. Instead of just hallucinations in the head, they were also kind of physical. As long as Wildside is conscious to keep it running, you are basically in a fever dream that feels super real and you can feel pain in. But if you knock him out, you're good. Black King, not to be confused with Black Tom from part one, Black King is a billionaire genius energy absorption secondary mutantist. He develops a secondary mutation. That's the point. Sebastian Shaw's original special skill is the energy absorption thing. He can use the absorbed kinetic energy to make himself stronger, faster, and just basically enhance himself. This makes him hard to beat. Many heroes are known for their ability to pack a punch, so what do you do when the better the punch you give, the better the enemy gets? Mental stuff! The secondary mutation comes when Sebastian underwent the Mother Vine enhancement process. The bonus he gets is that now he doesn't even need to get punched to absorb the kinetic energy. He can just absorb what's around him. Good for him, bad for everybody else. He also develops concussion blasts. The energy he absorbs can be like thrown at somebody. Wolverine's kiddo on Earth 1610 is taking after his dear old dad. James Jimmy Hudson Jr. has got the it factor, healing factor, and claws. First comes all that, and then comes the indestructible skeleton. His secondary mutation is that his skeleton gets coated in an organic metal. Wolverine famously has the atom skeleton after going through a brutal, rough procedure, but his son, he just comes with a built-in. It's what lets the kid have metal claws just like his dad. The metal trick can also make a pretty sturdy mouth guard. Unfortunately, Jimmy never knew his dad. Jimmy was adopted early in life, like newborn early, by Wolverine's friend James Hudson. But Jimmy did know the X-Men. Kitty Pride was one of the first to meet him. She brought some of Wolverine's stuff and a hologram of Wolverine explaining to Jimmy that he was his son. She encouraged him to try out his mutations for the first time. Sabretooth doesn't just hate Wolverine, apparently. He hates the whole family tree because Sabretooth attacked little Jimmy too. Well, he was a teen at the time, so he wasn't that little. Some parents pass down family rings and some enemies for life. If you are trying to find Jimmy online, you might see the alias Poison attached to it. Well, one horrible day, the Poison Hive invaded Earth 1610. One invaded Jimmy. Long story short, most of the poisons end up eliminated, but lucky for Jimmy, not the one in him. That one dubs itself just poison and walks the earth in Jimmy's body. They are not on the same side at first, they are each fighting for control of the body, but eventually their physical form is threatened. They have to put aside their differences to survive and agree to work together to escape. Eventually they head off together to figure out how to co-inhabit one body, and all of this happened in the Ultimate Universe. Sharon Ginsburg is like the Elle Woods and Batwoman of the Marvel Universe, let me explain. She is a mutant, but her civilian job is being a lawyer. Lawyer by day, bat-winged mutant by night, or whenever she she needs her wings. She is made for flying, her bones are lighter, and she is smaller than the average person. Her wings are massive, like at least a 15 foot wingspan, but because this is Marvel and everything is possible, she can easily hide the wings. The wings are her whole identity in terms of mutanthood, so losing those wings, that's a lot of trauma and pain and apparently the exact right amount to trigger a secondary mutation. Her secondary mutation brings in even more bat qualities. When her wings were roughly removed, she fell unconscious. Eventually waking up, she realized they were gone. She was so upset and angry, she manifested 
claws and she went insane. She was captured in X Statics 11 and we haven't seen her since. I hope she's doing well. Thanks to a secondary mutation, Havoc can wreak havoc forever. But first, Alex Summers' talents include energy absorption, even from something like a star. Because of that bit with the star, he is definitely immune to extreme heat and radiation too. He shoots plasma blasts, usually from his arms. They can be used as a weapon or to even help him fly. So that's pretty much everything he had going on before the secondary mutation. His secondary mutation appeared in the Mutant X storyline. Alternate reality versions of Alex Summers got yanked together by a cosmic force, and we don't really learn that anything serious mutation-wise has happened until Alex passes away, then does it. He wakes up in a different timeline and a different version of himself. Now, he has the ability to shift his consciousness from one version of himself to the next. Can he die? Maybe. Being a host for the nexus of all realities is what caused this. You've heard of Mother Earth. Get ready for Nature Girl. She does go by a few names, and I was not prepared for one of them. Her civilian name is Lin Lee, but her other mutant name is Armageddon Girl. That's a 180 from Nature Girl. It is fitting though, because she did do a 180. She started out as a hero. She attended the School for Gifted Youngsters, named the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning at the time. It had been established that she could control or influence nature and animals, make birds carry her, plants fight for her, that kind of stuff. She goes off the rails and joins the bad guys. Bad for everyone else, but good for her because she discovers her secondary mutation. She not only has a connection to all things in nature and can influence them, she can draw power from them to make herself more powerful. The power she is drawing though is basically the thing's life force, so she usually ends up killing whatever it is that she's drawing from. Right around one of the last times we saw her in the X-Men Unlimited Infinity comic is when she started going by the name Armageddon Girl. Pietro and Wanda are probably the most, maybe, famous mutants, it's a whole thing with them, of the Marvel Universe, but there's another set of definitely mutant power twins that deserve some attention too, North Star and Aurora. They are a beacon of light, literally. When they were babies, they were separated after a car crash killed their parents. While separated, they both learned of their mutant abilities on their own throughout their teenage years. Both twins are very fast. North Star used this to become an Olympic champion. They can both fly, but their big trick only appears when they are together, so sweet. When they physically touch, they can generate a powerful bright light. It can blind or simply just distract enemies. The secondary mutation manifests after a series of experiments requested by Aurora so that the twins can do the whole light thing without touching. It works and now they both have a semi-new talent. Angelic X-Men Warren Worthington III was just a guy until he got his wings. Then he was a mutant with the ability to shockingly fly. <laughs> the wings have other uses too, they are really strong, so he can use them to fight. Angel, unfortunately, got mixed up with Apocalypse, and Apocalypse planted a death seed in Warren. Warren becomes Archangel on his way to being the next Apocalypse, which is a very bad thing. He doesn't get there though, good news. What he does get is healing blood, kind of. Warren himself gets an accelerated healing factor, but if you were to get a blood transfusion from him, that blood is supercharged with the healing powers. We see this happen in Uncanny X-Men 420. I'll take a wild guess and say that he's got the universal blood type. He also got blue skin. He used to be just a guy. Look at him now. I've never been deep in the know when it comes to Elixir, so it was cool to find out that something I thought was just a core part of his standard mutation is actually perhaps secondary. For this point, we're talking about Elixir's physical mutation, the golden hue of his skin. This change occurred shortly after his first appearance. Only a few issues later, he actually uses his powers to heal himself and his skin changes to a golden color. So it seems to make sense that I wouldn't know this was even a secondary mutation since most of his appearances have been with this look. Joshua Foley aka Elixir's skin also changes color when he uses his powers to harm others, changing from a golden hue to a deep metallic black color. The changing of his skin is not something that Elixir also seems to be able to control but instead is a mutation that is closely tied to his primary healing and death touch abilities. If your skin changed color anytime you did anything, what would you definitely want it to be or not want it to be? While many heroes have secondary mutations, let's not forget that this whole idea in terms of when it was classified started with Emma Frost, who herself was once a famous villain. Likewise, there have been other villains who have also gained a secondary mutation, but who simply aren't as well known. Enter Black Tom Cassidy. A 
classic mutant villain, and if you aren't familiar with him, you should be. He's pretty cool. His secondary mutation has changed somewhat throughout his history. It's been described as giving him the upgraded ability to channel his bio blast through his fists, as opposed to needing wood to channel said blast, which is what he originally had, giving him his own plant form, and giving him the power to manipulate plants and wood around him. Like many others on our list, Black Tom actually got this sort of secondary mutation from being mortally wounded, but yeah, it's changed a lot throughout the years in terms of exactly how it works or what it does. It feels weird to include Beast also on this list, but when I think about most people I know who love the X-Men, they usually always think of Beast as being default blue. Now this is because most of the people I know grew up with the 90s or early 2000s Beast after he'd undergone his secondary mutation. Many fans out there still don't know that Beast's original power set was just that he was like super dexterous. He just looked like a guy. He had big feet, big hands, and he swung around a lot. Initially, Beast looked like this guy, but after being exposed to a serum he created, which isolates and boosts the X gene in mutants, he became permanently mutated again, gaining the secondary mutation of the blue fur. In fact, I think Beast may be the first mutant in comics to have developed a secondary mutation, before we even had a terminology for it at that time. He mutated. So he's all covered in blue fur, which initially was actually like a gray fur, but that's a whole other story. That has to do with comics coloring and miscommunications and just how blues and blacks got often mixed up by people. With this next one, we're not talking about that time that Kitty Pride was turned into a cat person in Wonder Gore, although that was a thing that happened. It was something though that she was given as opposed to an evolution of her mutant based abilities, and it was temporary. With Kitty, or Kate, it's interesting as there are a few different instances where I feel one could argue that she manifested some kind kind of secondary mutation, or more specifically, evolution of her powers. But this has also, I don't believe, ever fully been confirmed in the comics. Let me know if I miss something and if there is a page where someone says, this is a secondary mutation. <laughs> I'd like to focus on the heightening of her powers over the years, which I believe is the version of a secondary mutation, as I understand what secondary mutations are, which can either be a significant power boost, or it can be something additional. Some people, however, see secondary mutations as just something new and concrete added to a mutant's power set like Emma Frost diamond form, which exists separate from her telepathy, but it doesn't need to be that. And in fact, I think a major power boost does count, hence why I'm counting it. And if you don't agree, we can debate about it in the comments. Like when Kitty stopped needing to hold her breath while intangible, or when she was merged with the Black Vortex, becoming all powerful, but then after giving up the Black Vortex's power, discovered that she had unlocked a new level of power through that. So after using it, it was kind of like an additional mutation. As I said, there are actually multiple moments for Kitty when I feel like this has happened, but those are the main ones that come to my mind. Speaking of folks who have seen major power boosts throughout the years, enter Bob. Bobby Drake, aka Iceman. Iceman has had a few different moments like Kitty Pride, where I would say his powers have evolved and which could be considered a secondary mutation as he severely leveled up. When he learned he could manipulate his body into more than just ice or snow and learn to use his water form. When he learned he could just become straight up ice. That was a whole thing because before he was, I believe, covered in it. When he healed back up after having his ice form shattered. And when he learned he could make ice clones. Honestly, Bobby's just had a lot of moments because he's super OP. Sink developed a pretty powerful secondary mutation after he returned from the dead during the Krakoan era, so this is a recent one. So you might not know if you're not following with modern comics, or maybe you are and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the one I do know. His secondary mutation is more suspected, I would say, than confirmed. Well, we know he has this ability now, but we don't necessarily know if it is a secondary mutation or not. The ability in question is that he can now remain synced with other mutants, even without being near them. I believe the idea is if he's synced with you once, he can kind of sync with you whenever, but of course there are some limits to this and we're still kind of figuring out how that works. I don't think that sync using those powers if you're not near him would be as powerful. However, this mutation also takes a toll on his body and it seems to age him faster every time he uses it. In addition to this, he can also sync with superpowered non-mutants as well, which is huge. As I said, the full extent of his newfound abilities has not been explored and I don't know if everyone would consider them to be a secondary mutation, as they're still tied 
tied to the same power set, but I personally do. I believe secondary mutations can also manifest in a boost to a predetermined power set, and I think this should count. To me, it's a secondary mutation, so there you go. Take it or leave it. Cypher is another hero who went from being kind of lame to kind of insanely powerful thanks to his own secondary mutation. Honestly, I've become a pretty big Doug fan in recent years, now that I better understand just how powerful his power set can be. I think my love of Doug comes from me also realizing just as a person how important communication is in my everyday life, and how much I value being around other people who can communicate well, and also value my ability to communicate with them. When we can't understand each other, it actually creates big problems in our lives. And that's what I appreciate about Doug and his power set. His ability to communicate and through that resolve so many issues without even needing to come to blows. In terms of his mutation, we saw him go from a character who could just understand all languages and communicate with people in that way, to someone who really understood the various minute types of languages around us that often go unnoticed and thereby become a master of those types of languages as well. Things like technology, and even at one point physically fighting, which is a sort of physical communication or language and dance. This shift in his abilities happened after Doug died and was resurrected, and it honestly puts him on a whole other level, and really he's pretty powerful. I know sometimes we say, oh, communicating, is that powerful? Actually it is. <laughs> I always forget about Kid Omega's secondary mutation because it just very rarely comes up in the comics anymore. Probably because Quentin Quire no longer finds it interesting. At least that's the canon reason that we were given for this. Though I personally think it sounds super interesting, and I am surprised that he is bored of it. However, this is Quentin, so maybe I shouldn't be so surprised. He is often unimpressed by some of the coolest stuff, or at least he presents himself this way often. Kid Omega's secondary mutation here is a non-corporeal form, which when accessed also speeds up his consciousness and allows him as a tele path to reach out and connect with all sentient beings. He can think at the speed of light while in this form, but then again, even when Quire isn't in it, he is known for being one of the fastest thinkers and one of the smartest psionics on the planet. Maybe that's why he was like, eh, it's alright, I become like whatever, I don't have a physical form, but like, I'm pretty cool even when I have a physical form. Said to be the daughter of Unis the Untouchable, one of the earliest X-Men villains, Carmella's mutant power set is similar to her father's. However, at one point her powers evolved even beyond her own control. This seems to be a result of being exposed to Mother Vine, which triggered a secondary mutation in her. This mutation would cause her energy field to overcharge the more she used it, making it more devastating in terms of the damage it did to the people and technology around her. And if you aren't familiar with Unis the Untouchable, his main thing was that you couldn't touch him because he had a field around him that made it impossible to touch him. But this is also a field that blasts out in Carmela's case as well. What was worse, she had no control really over the power of her energy field field, and she also suffered as a result thanks to overcharge resulting in a backlash, so when it happened, she would also be in pain as well. So she'd be causing pain to others and then also be like, ow. I mean, I mean, she'd, I know she's like a villain normally, but still, sucks, you know? That would suck, whether you're a villain or not. Something about people being in near-death experiences that seemingly allows them to evolve out of survival. Mask is another one of those mutants, and Mask was inherently more of a villain in the comics, and also a Morlock. However, being a Morlock wasn't what made him evil, because Morlocks are not inherently evil. What made him evil was his outlook on life. His mutant powers allowed him to alter the appearance of others, basically turning him into one of the world's most powerful plastic surgeons. But at the same time, Mask was considered himself to be hideous, hence why he hid in the underground tunnels of New York with the Morlocks and usually led them. And his powers did not work on his own physical appearance. That is, until he was killed by Shatterstar. To survive, he had to move his organs around, and this actually unlocked the power within him to manipulate his own appearance. For a while, he actually used his powers to appear as Marilyn Monroe, no I'm not kidding, while leading the Morlocks. Although now Mask has seemingly gotten over his obsession with beauty and chooses to mostly appear just as he is. A friendly reminder to love your yourself, friends. Take a page out of Mask's book. Actually, th I, at least I think that's what happened to him. I, I don't know. I'm, I haven't read every single Mask issue, so. But I, if there isn't a Mask issue where he realizes, you know what, maybe I should love myself as I am, there should be one. And if there isn't, Marvel, if you need someone to write it, I'll write it for you. Number 10, Gwenpool. Gwenpool is truly one of the most unstoppable mutants. In fact, she is so unstoppable that she actually was able to make herself a mutant by willing that origin into existence existence for herself. I know, it's wild. Gwen Poole, for those who are unfamiliar, is an alternate version of Gwen Stacy and Deadpool combined, who hails from an alternate reality not yet given an official number. The temporary reality
fatality number assigned to it currently by fans is 565. Gwenpool becomes a mutant after Kamala Khan, the current Miss Marvel, refuses to fight her when Gwen tries to instigate a battle and instead tries to reason with Gwen. Kamala is the one who suggests that Gwenpool's understanding of the fourth wall and her belief that she is simply a character existing in a comic book could be a story that Gwen created as a result of not wanting to acknowledge the truth. The fact that she is actually a reality warping mutant. Possibly. The idea broke Gwen somewhat and caused her to retcon her own origins, instead becoming a reality warping mutant as Kamala had suggested and finding a home on Krakoa with all the other mutants of Earth 616. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and if you love it when we talk about mutants, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 9. Rogue Rogue is a mutant who truly is considered to be one of the most durable around. She can just take in a power set through absorbing someone's powers permanently adopting it. In fact, some may not know, but that is actually how Rogue is able to fly and where she gets her strength and her durability from. She actually stole those powers from Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel, aka formerly Miss Marvel, which is how she was known at the time. For a long time, Rogue was unable to properly control her powers, causing her to accidentally steal people's memories, powers, and even psyches just from touching them, and causing Rogue to often be much removed from her other fellow mutants, friends, and loved ones afraid she might hurt them accidentally after she became a hero, and resulting in her basically wearing fully covering outfits, except for her face of course. However, it was this very fear that apparently prevented Rogue from controlling her abilities, and once she faced it, she gained better control over her powers, making her virtually unstoppable. Which is also probably why a lot of writers keep her on the sidelines, or prefer to. She's kinda hard to write because she is so unstoppable now. Number 8. Magneto Pretty much nothing stops Magneto, not even losing his heart. Now, if you've seen our unstoppable superheroes list, then you know what I'm talking about. So for this point, I'm going to talk about another insane feat of Magneto's, other than when he defeated Uranus while completely heartless with some help from Storm. Not only can Magneto sustain his own flow of blood without a heart, using his powers, but he could also seriously mess you up by manipulating your blood in your body. Or even worse, mess you up by just pulling out all of the iron from your blood. We've seen him do that too, and it was pretty horrifying, I gotta say. Magneto has also used his mastery of magnetism to perform the kind of blood witchcraft you'd associate more with a magic user. A warlock if we were talking D&D &D classes, I suppose. Magneto has used this ability to manipulate the blood of his victims to also control their minds, turning them into mindless zombies who will do his bidding as a result of manipulating the flow of blood to their brains. Who needs telepathy when you have magnetic mutant powers, I guess? Number 7. Apocalypse I mean, there is a whole reality based around the idea of what what if Apocalypse was unable to be stopped? This reality is known as Earth 295 aka the Age of Apocalypse. And in this world, Apocalypse becomes pretty much inevitable thanks to the early demise of one man, Charles Xavier aka Professor X. AOA just goes to show you what a force Apocalypse is, and if you aren't convinced by an alternate reality where Apocalypse rules the world, you can also turn to a more recent X-Men event, Ten of Swords aka the Otherworld Tournament. During this fight, Apocalypse faced his wife who was possessed and even against the seemingly unbeatable foe that was Annihilation, Apocalypse still managed to win, saving his wife and freeing her from the influence of the Golden Helm while also basically saving all of Krakoa, mutant kind, and Otherworld. Possibly the world itself, outside of Otherworld. Number 6. Jean Grey You know how it goes, we have to talk about the most powerful original X-Men member if we're talking about Unstoppable Mutants. I just gotta do it. Jean Grey is a force to be reckoned with and not just because she was the host for the Phoenix Force either. Even without the insane power of the Phoenix Force bonded to her, Jean has done some pretty impossible things, including almost single-handedly defeating Null during the Absolute Carnage event. And okay, yeah, so she didn't she didn't really single-handedly defeat Null one-on-one, -on -one, but honestly, she probably could have if she really wanted to. She was, at the very least, integral to uncovering the god of symbiote's weakness. Jean has been an unstoppable force many times over, and even while serving on the X-Men team recently, used her powers to single-handedly defeat Nightmare, who has managed to terrorize even Doctor Strange before, and she used her power to defeat Cordyceps Jones and his entire casino, simply by trapping him in an illusion while the X-Men basically did their thing. From within that illusion, Jean says it best when it comes to just how powerful 
Marvel she truly is in issue number 11 of the recent X-Men series. I was Marvel Girl, now I am Jean Grey. I did not even let the Phoenix command me, so what chance do you have? Ooh, fair. I would never try to command Jean Grey. I would only let Jean Grey command me. Number five, Hope Summers. Hope is pretty understandably unstoppable. I mean, she combined with the powers of Wanda was even powerful enough to defeat the Phoenix Force, which is known for being extremely stubborn, resilient, and of course, pretty much invincible and indestructible. Now granted, the Phoenix Force did not remain defeated forever. It was not permanently destroyed, but that wasn't really as a result of Scarlet Witch and our Hope being ineffective. That was more to do with the cyclical nature of comics where, well, Rarely anyone or anything remains dead, banished, or defeated. Hope is unstoppable because her mutant power allows her to adopt any other mutant powers. So really the only way to defeat her would be to put her in an isolation chamber and good luck getting her there, considering that she currently lives on an island where she is constantly surrounded by all kinds of mutants from all different alignments and where some of the most powerful mutants known to us reside. And then there's also the fact that, I mean, technically Hope kind of worked with Wanda's power and now Wanda isn't a mutant, so what does that even mean? Does that mean Hope can just take any powers? I'm, I'm still not sure about that. Number four, Miranda. Miranda doesn't have a fancy code name. She's just Miranda. Well, not necessarily canon in the main continuity, Miranda is still one of the most unstoppable mutants I could think of, so I'm including her here, despite the fact that I believe she does exist outside 616. Although with her power set, that is something that seems like it could easily and quickly change if Miranda willed it to be so. Miranda is from the story X-Men Worst X-Man Ever, a limited series covering only one arc by Max Bemis and Michael Walsh. We are introduced to Miranda through Bailey Hoskins, who is the self-proclaimed worst X-Man ever. Bailey's powers allow him to self-detonate, in essence a human bomb, but that is all he can do, which means that it's kind of a one-use power, therefore lame and not really useful at all because, you know, if you use it, you'll be dead. Bailey also isn't particularly skilled, athletic, or smart. On the contrary, his friend Miranda can warp reality, shaping it as she sees fit. If Bailey is the worst, Miranda is kind of the best. While Miranda does use her powers, Bailey doesn't even seem to notice at one point, calling her out years later for not doing enough, when, oddly enough, the whole time, Miranda has been unknowingly saving the whole world and possibly the universe multiple times over, which she reveals and is like, I was here the whole time like saving everyone, but you know, I just changed reality so no one really notices. <laughs> Number three, Squirrel Girl. I mean, isn't unstoppable just a synonym when you think about it for unbeatable? For some reason, when it comes to mutant lists, I always tend to forget that Squirrel Girl herself is a mutant. I don't know why I forget about Doreen because I love her so much. And this also happens to me despite the fact that when we're first introduced to her in the comics, she advertises herself to Iron Man as a mutant. I guess it's because Squirrel Girl, despite being a mutant, is not often associated with the X-Men, but instead prefers to align herself more with the Avengers, or the Great Lakes Avengers anyways, and other Avenger-based teams. Number two, Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister might strike you as an odd pick for one of our top spots on this list, but with what he has been up to lately, I gotta say, I think he deserves it. As we ramp up to the Sins of Sinister event, which I'm sure is going to be a banger, but also end up destroying the beautiful golden era that has been X-Men comics recently, and Krakoa, poor Krakoa. Sinister is quickly becoming the most powerful he has ever been. Currently, this is all thanks to his Moira protocols, as revealed in Immortal X-Men. With the Moira protocols, Mr. Sinister can control the timeline, basically tweaking it as he sees fit to better understand the best way for him to shape the world as he would like it to be. If he makes a change that doesn't actually work out for him in the end, he just destroys that powered Moira clone that he has to erase that change and outcome and then kind of like tries again. So this allows him with all the Moira clones that are powered to try, well, infinite possibilities for what the world could be, which is pretty scary. This is an insane level of power and could possibly make him one of the most unstoppable mutants ever, unless a whole bunch of mutants and heroes are able to do something about this. Though, he might not be the most unstoppable. Number one, Iska the Unbeaten. Iska is truly unbeatable. Even the closest I have ever seen to her being beaten, she wasn't 
really beaten at all. She still won, but in winning, she also kinda lost? Does that make sense? Let me explain. The Fisher King on planet Araco, formerly known as Mars, following the events of AXC and the invasion of the eternal Uranus, who destroyed much of the planet and many of its mutant population, ended up challenging Iska to a battle of understanding. The Fisher King did this as a way of getting back at Iska the traitor, who had turned on her own people in the past and then did so again when Uranus first attacked the planet, turning on her fellow seats on the Great Ring of Araco. This is not something Iska chose to do, but something she was forced to do as a result of her power because she can never lose. And so to beat her in his own way, knowing that he wouldn't win, the Fisher King challenged her to a battle of understanding where the winner is the one who most truly understands the meaning of loss. Ho ho ho! As you can imagine, Iska won, but in so doing, she felt great grief over all that she had lost and chose to leave Araco and resign her seat on the Great Ring. This is the closest I've ever seen to Iska losing something. And still, she technically won because she understood grief the best between the two, or understood the idea of loss, I should say. Iska is such a fascinating character, so while she is gone for now from Araco, I do hope we continue to see her appear in the Books. I mean, who knows? Maybe she'll be the key to defeating Sinister? I don't know. Number 10, Moira McTaggart. Moira McTaggart, when she was a mutant, was pretty unstoppable. I mean, she almost single handedly destroyed all mutants from behind the scenes, which I think is pretty wild. And she also posed as someone working to save all mutant kind on various occasions, which I think also made her unstoppable in a different kind of way. Moira McTaggart, of course, is no longer a mutant in the comics as she was depowered, but her mutation was reincarnation. With the knowledge of of prior lives lived, carry that forward into her next life. In fact, Moira's power was so great that it was proven to be connected to the very fabric of time and reality, with the whole universe seemingly resetting after each of her deaths. This also means that even after being depowered, Sinister was able to create and use clones of Moira with their mutant gene activated to predict the outcome of various events and shape reality in his own image. In essence, Sinister can now use Moira, or more specifically, Moira clones, to attempt various tactics in order to get things as he would like them. Now, when a tactic fails, he simply destroys that Moira clone, thereby erasing that tactic, its outcome, and the resulting timeline slash reality. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love it when I talk about mutants, I know I love it, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number nine, Franklin Richards. Franklin Richards might not have his powers currently in the comics, but that doesn't stop him from being one of the most powerful mutants to have ever existed, and definitely the most unstoppable at least across time. Besides, I'm pretty sure Franklin will have his powers and his mutant status back eventually. Like Gwenpool, Franklin was also revealed to have willed himself into becoming a mutant, although he did so subconsciously, which is even more nuts. Franklin's powers were of the reality warping variant, and apparently without knowing it, he used them to make himself appear as a mutant. However, as his powers waned, it was made clear that he was not truly one, but simply appearing as one thanks to these powers. And apparently this was confirmed when we noticed that, yeah, Franklin, uh, oh wait, no, you're not actually a mutant. You're just a depowered mutate. So, whoops. This is why he ended up getting rejected from Krakoa, although Professor X did not appear to Franklin personally, but simply in his astral form. Number eight, Darwin. Darwin is one of the mutants who was brought on the mission to infiltrate the Children of the Vault's home base, known of course simply as the Vault. Darwin was handpicked for this mission due to his unique mutation, which allows him to adapt to any situation, evolving himself to best survive whatever he comes up against. For this reason, he's pretty unstoppable. This is also why the Children of the Vault valued him and ended up capturing him, because his mutation was also valued amongst them and makes them a lot more unstoppable as they can implement it into their own evolution to help them evolve smarter and faster, making them even more formidable foes for the X-Men. Number seven, Sunspot. Sunspot is a mutant that I feel I do not talk about enough on this channel, so I'm using this list to grow his ego just a little bit more. Sunspot is unstoppable in many ways. He's not only powerful as a mutant, even willing to give his life to save the day, refusing to be stopped by whatever problem comes his way, but he's also insanely ruthless when it comes to the world of business. He is wealthy and so often can break through barriers that some mutants might be limited by due to their income bracket. 
Besides that, Roberto is probably also one of the most stubborn characters, not even just mutants, that we have in comics. And for that reason, he is also personally pretty unstoppable, as he doesn't usually give up or throw in the towel easily. And if you want to talk about power levels, woo! Sunspot has been referred to before as one of the most powerful mutants ever. Now granted, I think he was the one who called himself that, but Bobby's ego aside, I do actually myself believe him to be one of the most powerful. Number 6, Destiny. I love this suggestion from Jamie Doughty who commented on our last video saying, I think Destiny will be the ultimate stop to Sinister. She's got something planned, as always. And I imagine a smirk at the end of this comment, as always, smirk. Because well, you are so right Jamie, Destiny does always have something up her sleeve. This is just because she is so good at seeing the future. There is very little Destiny seemingly can't see when it comes to all the multiple possibilities of the world. And I do agree that Destiny will likely play a key role in the demise later on of Sinister. Straight out of the gate she threw many wrenches into his various attempts to enact his plan. If it weren't for Destiny, Sinister would have succeeded potentially a lot more easily. And sooner. Also, people never think of mutants with precognitive abilities as being unstoppable because, well, they're usually pretty squishy, but you don't have to worry as much about being squishy when one, your wife is one of the most deadly mutants, Mystique, and two, you can pretty much just like sidestep almost any and all dangers headed your way by seeing their potential before they have even arrived. Number 5, Emma Frost. Emma Frost is one of the best telepathic minds we have in the comics. She has proven herself to be even more powerful than some of the most iconic telepathic mutants, such as Professor Xavier himself, at one point laying traps in Cyclops' mind with which to ensnare Xavier should he attempt to enter Scott's mind, which of course he did. Emma also has proven how deadly she is when she manipulated the mutants into going to war during the Inhumans vs X-Men event. Not her finest moment to be sure as a hero. Speaking of her being a villain, she also successfully stole Storm's body for a time in a body swap, managing to briefly infiltrate the X-Men, and even when Emma isn't using her own powers and mastering them, she's proving how powerful she is while using some Someone else's. Like when she swapped bodies with Iceman and was able to use his powers to turn into water and travel through currents. So not only is Emma a powerful telepath, teacher, and businesswoman in her own right, but she can also be quite good at mastering mutant skills and power sets which don't even belong to her which is probably what also makes her a really good teacher. Number 4, Mad Jim Jaspers. He is a weird mutant that actually started out as a villain who was anti-mutant himself. Mad Jim Jaspers was in essence someone who was seen as pro-human and anti-mutant until people realized he himself was a mutant with reality warping powers. He ended up being quite the foe as well and despite having died multiple times has returned time and time again. Most recently he returned in Otherworld, first spotted there during the Otherworld tournament showcased in the Ten of Swords event. Jim literally just popped up there as the person in charge of the crooked market in Otherworld, a sort of black market in the fantasy world where a person can literally find and acquire anything they could possibly think of, no matter how rare, elusive, or seemingly forbidden. The even stranger thing is, last we saw him before this, I believe Jaspers was once again dead, and his random appearance was not explained here. So we still don't really know how he came back to life and got to Otherworld. I suppose we can chalk that up to just how unstoppable Mad Jim and his power set are. Number three. Sink. Sink has recently become one of the most OP mutants to many X-Men fans. He was resurrected on Krakoa earlier as he was needed for a mission to infiltrate the vault, where the children of the vault had retreated to. The team was three mutants who are known for their unstoppable level of resilience, especially combined. It included Laura Kinney, formerly known as X-23, currently known as Wolverine, Darwin, and Sink. Of the three, only Sink seemingly survived and escaped once they had the intel that they needed. Although later, we learned that Laura also managed to survive. So now we kind of have two Lauras in the comics, old Laura and younger Laura, as she was initially believed dead and therefore resurrected. Sink was able to get valuable information back to Krakoa before dying himself and being resurrected once more in a younger body. You see, in the vault, time moves differently, so he and the team had actually lived there for hundreds of years, despite the fact that a much shorter period of time had passed outside of the vault on Earth. Upon being resurrected, Sink's powers seemed to mutate further, allowing him to retain the powers of a mutant that he'd synced with previously. 
as opposed to only being able to use their powers while nearby and synced with them. Although using this power to its fullest extent does seem to be hard on Sync's body. So there is that. Number two, Iceman. I think Iceman has proven time and time again that he can't be stopped. The story I recanted earlier where Emma was able to use Bobby's power while in his body to travel through water as water, that is also something Bobby himself can now do, as was evident when he fought recently against Fin Fang Foom in the first run of the Marauder series. His fellow mutants and teammates had thought that Bobby had been destroyed when in reality he hadn't. It looked like Fin Fang Foom obliterated him, but Bobby, being Bobby, he just turned to water, went into the ocean, and came back up again, proving that he is a force to be reckoned with. Even hell can't stop Bobby. He'll just freeze it over again, as he's also done in the past before. And to be honest, it would probably be even easier for him this time around, as he's continued to grow in power since then. You know you're unstoppable when you're able to do things like freeze hell over. Number one, Storm. Storm is not just a mutant with unbelievably unstoppable powers, she is also a literal goddess. What does that mean? Well, it means that Storm can be even more unstoppable just from the power of belief. At one point, Storm ends up literally being confirmed as a goddess after people believed for her to be one for years. We are shown that when people believe in Storm, this gives her even more power. Which is wild, because base level power Aurora Monroe is already off the charts. Storm is a fearless leader who does not even fear death himself, even going so far as to dance with a version of death, Apocalypse's son, and one of his original four horsemen. And she beats death in combat too, which is pretty wild. Of course, you know, this isn't mistress death, but it simply goes to show how fearless Storm is, whether we're talking literal death, metaphysical death, or an alternate representation of death. Number 10, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler does not get enough love on our channel. I know at times I can be the one ragging on him, but at the end of the day, I really do love Kurt Wagner. I think he is a fascinating character and one of the most complex individuals that we actually have on the X-Men team. Even though his teleportation powers are not as impressive as some other mutant teleporters that we have, such as Magic or Manifold, Nightcrawler is still a character whose determination and faith tend to be his driving force, helping him to do the unimaginable at times. And there is no length to which he wouldn't go to help out his teammates, his friends, and his family, the X-Men. In fact, at one point, Nightcrawler even left heaven after his death and returned to life just to help them out. That's that's pretty wild. Can't stop that. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not let us know that you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Do it! And if you already did it, thank you. You're great. Number 9, Moira McTaggart. You wouldn't have likely thought of Moira McTaggart as an unstoppable mutant. Probably though because you wouldn't have even thought of her as being a mutant. But here we are, and here she is. She is a mutant. During the Krokoan era of the X-Men comics, it was revealed to us right near the beginning, during the Dawn of X period, that Moira this entire time was actually a mutant. What? And what's even more insane is she might have one of the most interesting and powerful abilities out there. Her power allows her to resurrect after her death, but not by coming back to life, but simply by living her life all over again, thereby resetting the continuity, manipulating the very fabric of reality and how we perceive it. Moira has lived multiple lives, always remembering the ones that came before. This gave her knowledge which allowed her to manipulate the course of history. Number 8, Wolverine. One of the most skilled and effective trackers we have over at Marvel Comics, and I would say probably one of my most favorite characters. If you try to run from him, there is likely nowhere safe for you to hide, at least not on planet Earth. And even possibly not in the cosmos either. Has Wolverine ever gone to track someone across the stars? Because that is a story I would love to read. Oh wait, there was something similar to that in the X-Men Infinity comic, where Wolverine was tracking lost mutants through space. There's the little online ones that you can get on Marvel Unlimited that you scroll through, by the way, that are kind of like webtoons. Wolverine is not a man who often gives up, even when he wants to. And based on how tragic his life has been, there have been many moments where Wolverine has wanted to call it quits. But even then, he keeps on going. Not even his own will to give up can stop him from soldiering on. Number 7, Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister isn't just one man, he can literally be an army of clones. What is more unstoppable than that? Well, not much. Especially when you consider just how brilliant and deadly he and each of his clones can be, with their immense knowledge of mutant DNA and twisted approach to evolution. Mr. Sinister isn't just one of my favorite mutants because of his fabulous look, although that definitely only makes me love him more, to be honest. It's because he's always up to something, always scheming and planning and hiding in the shadows. And when Sinister schemes, it can be dangerous, like to the point that he can take over the whole world by manipulating and tailoring the timeline to his liking. That kind of dangerous. See Sins of Sinister for more on what I'm talking about there. 
Number 6 Exodus We don't talk about Exodus enough. As you know I'm a big fan of psionic powers outside of I would say super speed and teleportation. I think this might actually be like my favorite power set and definitely is one of the power sets I consider to be the most powerful. Why do I love it so? Why do I consider it to be so powerful? Because it allows you to defeat someone without ever having to really lift a finger. In the physical world anyways. Exodus might not be as well known as some of the others on this list but trust me when I say he is one of the most powerful telepaths and telekinetics out there. We have seen him prove himself in psionic battles against ancient eternal creatures that were in essence kind of like dragons. In fact, I believe he even literally fought a dragon as well at one point. Exodus not only has his mutant powers which were at an insane level already when they first manifested, but he also had them enhanced by apocalypse, making him even more powerful. In fact, he is considered to be one of the most powerful mutants in existence. If that doesn't make him unstoppable, I do not know what would. Number 5 Cassandra Nova I mean Cassandra Nova is seriously just crazy. I love her and I also kind of love to hate her. I mean that's that's the beauty of Cassandra Nova. Technically she is not quite a mutant. Instead she is a mummadry which is basically like an evil twin that you have to defeat to be born, at least according to the Shi'ar. In Cassandra's case she is the evil twin of Charles Xavier whose powers first manifested in the womb before he was born so that he might stop Cassandra who attacked him at that time. As a result Cassandra was defeated and Charles lived on. Being born into the world. However, even then, this wouldn't be the end for Cassandra. She actually survived as basically a collection of cells that look like goo, and she managed to once again manifest, returning even stronger than she was before. And yeah, like I said, she's a mama dry, but she's also like a mama dry of Charles, so that kind of makes her a mutant. And right now, or at least recently, last time I was reading Marauders, she was fighting for the mutants because she kind of allied herself. She kind of saw herself as one. So I mean, yeah, it kind of depends on the story. Story, but I think we can consider her immune. Number 4 Jean Grey Jean Grey was once the Phoenix Force, but even without the Phoenix Force, she is a powerhouse. In fact, at one point, Jean even stated the Phoenix Force was, get this, actually holding her back. What? Even without her connection to the Phoenix, even when she is not a host, Jean has proven herself as one of the most unstoppable mutants out there. She has gone toe to toe with gods and not only survived, but also won. Jean Grey is also one of the most unstoppable in the sense that she doesn't even really need to mess you up to win a fight with you. And I think that is a really impressive strength. Or rather, I guess I, I should say she really only needs to mess you up mentally, maybe, but then even then, not in a way that leaves you like catatonic or anything like that. She isn't safe. She won't necessarily just like wipe your mind or anything like that. She doesn't need to. Instead, she'll give you an entirely new perspective that will make you change your own mind. Number 3 Magneto While Magneto was stopped a while ago with him seemingly being killed during the long and epic fight that he had against Uranus, Magneto still wasn't even really stopped there. Now, allow me to explain. I know that's a contradiction. Minus everything that may or may not be going with him potentially returning from the dead in Scarlet Witch's comic, unless that's Joseph, his younger clone, and it could be. I'm not up to date on Scarlet Witch, so if there's some things that have come up in the last couple issues, shh, don't spoil it for me in the comments. Magneto actually never died in his first battle with Uranus, despite literally having his heart removed. Magneto willed his blood to keep like pumping through his body, using the iron in his blood to help control and move it through him. With his mutant powers going into overdrive to act as a temporary replacement for his heart during the AXC or the Axe event, when he was essentially trapped on planet Araco, aka Mars, as he also fought to defend it. And even during his rematch with Uranus, he really only went out because he chose to go. Sounds pretty unstoppable to me, I'm just saying. Number 2 Storm Storm is one of the best, more badass characters that we have around. She is unstoppable on, honestly, a lot of different fronts. Not just because of her mutant powers to control the weather and manipulate the atmosphere around her, sometimes even the world over. Not just because of her insane fighting skills and physical prowess, and not even just because Storm is a goddess. And honestly, not even just because Storm is also an amazing leader, she's also that too. A lot of the time for me, it's Storm's spirit and her determination that just makes her the most unstoppable. She does not give up, even when it seems like defeat is basically inevitable. Storm makes her own path and does not let others define her, and that is both what I admire the most about her and what I think makes her often such a force to be reckoned with. Willful, strong, and undefeatable. Storm knows who she is and she isn't afraid to show it, and I, I love that about her. That's, that's being unstoppable right there, knowing who you are and being like, this is who I am, that's it. Take it or leave it, but you gotta take it because I'm unstoppable. 
Number 1. Apocalypse Apocalypse is definitely one of the most unstoppable mutants around. He is one of, if not the most deadly mutant that we have, I would say. There is a whole alternate reality where Apocalypse has successfully conquered the world, and there have been a few times where he's also come close to doing that in the main continuity. That's why I personally was both so amazed and so surprised, kind of scared, when I saw Apocalypse join the mutant nation of Krakoa. Initially my thoughts were, uh oh, when is, when is he going to betray them, because that's going to happen. But over time I came to understand that Apocalypse being so unstoppable didn't always have to be a bad thing, as he is also allied literally with all the mutants. He could actually be a force for good in that way, because if there's anything that Apocalypse does believe in, he believes in mutants, and so it kind of worked really perfectly that he'd work with them. Ultimately though, Apocalypse wants mutants to be at their best and to be on top. So as soon as there is a disparity between what he wants for mutant kind and what the people and other leaders of Krakoa want, he's probably going to go back to being unstoppable in a more villainous way. Number 10, Emma Frost. She's probably the biggest name on this list. It almost feels like everyone knows her powers, but someone suggested her in the comments and well, she's awesome. Emma Frost possesses telepathic abilities on a similar level to Charles Xavier. She's been referred to as an Omega class telepath and has demonstrated the ability to stalemate Exodus and overcome telepaths such as Nate Gray and Rachel Summers through greater experience and skill. With her telepathy, Emma Frost can create psionic shields, telepathic cloaking, telepathic illusions, she can absorb information and upload information into others. Emma can project one's astral form from their body onto the astral planes or the physical planes. She can inhibit others' powers, induce pain, erase a person's memories, and heal mental trauma through psychic surgery. She has intuitive multilingualism, mind control, can create mental links, induce mental paralysis and sedation. She can alter others' minds, cause a kind of mental amnesia. She can telepathically detect and track others, not to mention produce psionic blasts and psionic lightning. And that's not mentioning her secondary mutation of a diamond form. This grants her super durability, strength and stamina as well as psychic immunity, but at the cost of her psychic powers. Number 9. Black Tom Cassidy Black Tom Cassidy is the cousin of Sean Cassidy, who is Banshee, and he was originally a longtime crime partner to the villain Juggernaut. But his powers are interesting to say the least. Originally, his mutant power was bio-organic thermokinetic blasts, generating concussive blasts of force through any wooden medium. Normally, it was a, forgive my pronunciation, a shillalag, which is a traditional Irish wooden fighting stick. Tell me if I messed it up in the comments, please. After a fight with Cable, doctors grafted a wood-like substance onto his wounds, healing him and allowing him to channel his bio blast directly through his fists. But as a result of a genetic virus, the substance spread over Tom's whole body, turning him into a Groot-like looking dude, which actually worked to his benefit as the secondary mutation gave him plant growth, allowing him to grow to immense size, superhuman strength, a healing factor, chlorokinesis, which is control over plant life within his vicinity. He could distribute his consciousness among plants he controlled, and Cassidy could drain the life force of organic beings. He eventually returned to a human form, but kept the capacity to control plants to a limited degree, mainly focusing his powers on wood specifically and using the energy channeling aspect of his powers. He could increase his striking power to generate protective shield. Number eight, Sebastian Shaw. Sebastian Shaw is a mutant that you'll probably best recognize for being the Black King of the Hellfire Club, or the guy who somehow took out Darwin in the X-Men First Class movie. I still think that was dumb. His powers are actually a bit different from that movie though. Shaw has the ability to absorb energy, specifically all forms of kinetic energy directed at him and use it to enhance his strength, speed, and stamina. This includes physical damage such as that sustained in battle and kinetic blasts such as Cyclops optic blast or Gamma's explosions. That's why you'll sometimes see him punching walls, being hit by his own underlings, or allowing himself to be hit by his foes in order to build up more and more of the kinetic energy to empower himself. He can also absorb and use other forms of energy such as electricity and magical energy as shown in Avengers Academy when fighting Hercules. He can build up and store this energy and release it whenever he chooses. His biggest power, however, comes in the form of being such a powerful and influential figure in the Hellfire Club. Number 7. Jason Wingard Jason Wingard, otherwise known as Mastermind, is basically an illusionist. But 
a very, very powerful one. He can psionically manipulate the senses of other people, causing them to see, hear, touch, smell, and or taste things which do not actually exist, or see, hear, touch, smell, and or taste real things in ways that they would not do naturally. So, for example, he can seem to make a solid wall appear in an empty space, or he can make himself look and sound like a different person, or look and feel like a wall or even seem invisible. Since his power only affects the mind, his illusions cannot be recorded with cameras or anything like that, but his power is so strong that even if his victims know they are being subjected to an illusion, they will still react to the illusion as if it were reality. And Unless they can rid themselves of all suspicion that it is indeed reality, which sounds a little confusing. Basically, if Mastermind creates the illusion of a wall, most people, even if they know it's an illusion, will still be unable to walk through that wall. His most famous usage of his power, in my opinion, is when he attempted to manipulate Jean Grey, which led to that whole dark phoenix thing. Good job, dude. Number six, Sunspot. Roberto da Costa is another mutant that a lot of people have heard of, especially in the more recent stories that have been coming out of Marvel. But that doesn't mean everyone knows his powers. Bobby da Costa's mutant ability allows him to store solar energy in his cells through a similar method to the way we store energy when we eat food. He can then release it when necessary to enhance his physical strength, usually with the side effect of his body being cloaked in darkness because he drains all the ambient light from his skin, which sounds really cool. The enhancements to his strength through this radiation have allowed him to knock down an alternate universe Hulk, even drawing blood and even restraining Gladiator of the Shi'ar. But other than his physical enhancements, he has also used the energy he absorbs to fly faster than light speed, use pyro and thermokinesis, firing blasts of heat and dark solar plasma, as well as using photokinesis directing light. He's also incredibly tricksy, displayed when he recently manipulated Iska the Unbeaten. I just love this character. Number five, Trevor Fitzroy. Trevor here, who goes just by Fitzroy, is actually from Earth 1191. There, he was the illegitimate son of Anthony Shaw, the Black King of the Hellfire Club. Trevor's mutant ability was to drain other living beings of their life force, converting it into energy and absorbing it into himself, usually disintegrating his victims. With this life force, he can do a few different things, like opening temporal wormholes to travel across time and space, teleportation, shifting objects into different time frames, altering the flow of time to return people or objects to a previous incarnation, and freezing people in a type of stasis. The thing is, the usage of his power depends on the life force he absorbs. So for example, one wormhole would be equivalent to one person's life force. It's a little scary to be honest. He did get a big power boost in the Bishop The Last X-Men series, where he tries to become time itself. He is a super cool and super super dangerous character. Definitely check him out. Number four, Harold Leland. Harold Leland was an alcoholic and obese corporate lawyer and also a mutant with the abilities to increase the mass or gravity of a person or object within his line of sight. He can use this ability to increase mass all at once or over time, slowly increasing the more a victim struggles. The power has shown to even break the ground beneath a target depending on the strength of that ground. So for example, there was a time that he sent Wolverine from inside inside the Hellfire Club all the way through the floor and the ground into the sewers. Also, the human targets would suffer great strain in their muscles, particularly in the heart, with the possibility of suffering physical damage. And if Leland uses his power on an item, that item could crumble if it wasn't particularly durable. Leland joined the Hellfire Club, an elite social club for the rich and wealthy located in New York's Fifth Avenue, under Sebastian Shaw. He isn't the most impressive fighter, but his ability has come in handy more than a few times. Number three. Three, Emma Steed. Emma Steed is actually the Black Queen of the London Hellfire Club. If you are noticing a lot of Hellfire Club members here, that's because there are a lot with very cool powers and not a lot of people know much about them at all. For example, Emma Steed here has a rare form of telepathic power called psionic skinning. This basically allows Emma to create blades of pure psionic energy to attack and disable her foes. These blades aren't purely for physical attack. They actually allow her to do a number of things like 
life, warping the minds of people, igniting pain sensors, destroying physical portions of their brain, and destroying psionic forms or astral projections. Using this ability, she was able to de-life the Shadow King, who is a incredibly powerful telepath. As a secondary result of her powers, she is basically immune to any type of psionic or telepathic attack, with her presence being absolutely destructive to telepaths. Number 2, Cora of the Burning Heart. Can we just get an applause for literally the coolest name ever? Like, Cora of the Burning Heart. That's awesome. Cora of the Burning Heart is a mutant from Morocco where she served as an assassin and primarily used her power only to boost her own abilities in battle, thanks to the Iraqi being really stubborn, honor bound fighters. But Cora's abilities can indeed help others as well. Cora's heart is an internalized combustion furnace, which generates life force energy. Thanks to that energy, she gets this really awesome looking flaming skeletal appearance, and she uses this constant energy source to give herself incredible incredible physical capabilities, as well as boost up the powers of others around her to even greater heights. She was a member of the X Terminators alongside Cable, and she is also a part of S.W.O.R.D. Also, Cora of the Burning Heart. Sorry, just wanted to say it again. Super cool. Number 1. Amelia Vought Amelia was a mutant born with the ability to transubstantiate solid matter into vapor that she can control. And honestly, it's such a great ability. Seeing the things she can do with this ability is really cool. I said she can transubstantiate matter, and that is including herself and other people. When she turns herself into vapor, she is obviously unharmed by physical attacks, but can then fly through the air as vapor and pass through small holes or cracks. But the vapor is still physically there, which means she can still move objects as vapor. She has also turned her allies into vapor to get them out of dangerous situations, substantiating them beside her. And she's even stolen weapons off of enemies, turning them into vapor, which she then reformed in her own hands. But wait, there's more. Using the astral plane, Amelia is able to transport herself and anything else across the surface of the globe in an instant, even summoning distant people to herself by telling teleportation, converting them into mist and then bringing that mist into her presence to be reformed. It's just super cool. Coming in right at number 10 is Richter. Julio Richter has a pretty interesting mutant power. Richter can manipulate various aspects of the planet itself. Originally his powers manifested in simple seismic energy, allowing him to create earthquakes, shock waves, and rudimentary transport of earth matter. However, after Richter's powers evolved, he now has the ability to remotely terraform the ground around him in a much more precise manner. He can toss rocks around with precision or will the ground to open up like a tunnel. But he also has some skill with plants, controlling vines and other plants to ensnare his opponents. Julio also gained magma kinesis after being trapped under an active volcano and just rising out of it, riding on top of the magma like an absolute badass. More impressive than that though is that Richter's powers have created a psychic slash empathic bond between himself and the primal life force of Earth's biosphere, allowing him some clairvoyance and mysticism. Definitely one of the coolest characters I have never heard of. I just wanted to pause here to say if you're enjoying this list so far, dropping a like is all you have to do to help us out and let us know that this is what you want to see. And on that note, we're gonna get to number nine, who is Gorgeous George. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and when I behold George Blair, Gorgeous is not the word that comes to mind, but nonetheless, that is the name he holds. Gorgeous George's body is composed of this tar or putty-like stuff that, through his thoughts, can be expanded, morphed, and reshaped in any way he wants. Using this ability, he has been able to turn his entire body into a puddle or make himself extremely slippery to avoid capture. Side note, becoming extra slippery just makes me like, Ick, you know, I don't, I don't like that slipperiness. George is also very hard to injure. He can reconstitute parts of his body and can even bend to dodge attacks. The slippery thing also kind of helps with this as well. He has also once tried to choke Strong Guy by using his powers to enter his lungs, which is just a terrifying thought. On a lighter note though, his arms are actually longer than normal because he forgot their 
normal length after getting drunk with other members of Mr. Sinister's Nasty Boys. Well, that's kind of cool. Number eight, Thumbelina. Are you getting tired of seeing all these super powered beings who look like they just walked off a runway? Well, lucky for you, there is Christina Anderson who goes by the moniker of Thumbelina. She's short, she's stout, she's slow, and she's always being made fun of. But she has a pretty useful mutant ability. Thumbelina can shrink down to a quarter of an inch, making her an excellent candidate for missions of espionage with the Mutant Liberation Front. The best part about Thumbelina's powers though is that she retains her full size strength in her miniature size and has even been shown to actually increase in strength as she shrinks. So make fun of her all you want, but Thumbelina has proved instrumental to the Mutant Liberation Front team, even being the reason their first mission was such a success. Number seven is Strong Guy. I kinda can't believe I haven't talked about Guido Carousella yet. Despite this guy's massive hulking appearance, he is one of the most entertaining mutants around. Essentially, Guido, who goes by the name Strong Guy, has the ability to absorb kinetic energy and use it to enhance his physical strength. Now at a base level, he can lift around 50 tons, which is already more than a lot of superpowered beings. But using his kinetic absorption, he can boost that strength up to far above 100 tons, making him one of the strongest characters in Marvel Comics. Unfortunately, Guido's body suffers from his mutation. Storing the kinetic energy he absorbs for more than 90 seconds will permanently distort his body in very painful ways. The distortions he's already suffering from cause him to be in constant pain, which, being the great guy he is, pushed him towards being absolutely hilarious to hide his pain. Hey y'all, if you love the manga, if you love the anime, well then make sure to check out Most Amazing Top 10 Anime. James is an awesome host bringing you videos just like this one, but with that manga and anime setting. You should definitely check it out. And coming off of that, number six is Layla Miller. Of all the mutant powers I've come across, resurrection is one that doesn't actually happen too often. But Layla's resurrection ability is an interesting one. It comes with a major side note. Layla has the ability to resurrect dead beings, restoring their bodies and their consciousness, but not their soul. Without their soul, the resurrected being will have no conscience or morality. We saw this happen both with Strong Guy and Trevor Fitzroy, who were resurrected by Layla, who eventually experienced drastic changes in their personality without their souls. Another key factor about this resurrection is that it can only be performed within minutes of the individual's death. Layla claims she can also reverse this process, taking back the life that she gives. Another interesting note for Layla is that during the House of M, Layla Layla was resistant to Wanda's reality warping abilities and retained all of her memories. She could even give others back their memories. She's also been to the future and studied magic with Doctor Doom, so like, that's cool as well. Coming in at number five is M. Just the letter M. Monet St. Croix has an interesting past, and honestly, her family is a big part of that. Her brother is an incredibly powerful bad dude who trapped her in a different form where she is known as Penance. As Penance, she has diamond skin, a telepathic resistance, and super sharp claws. M can even combine with her younger siblings Claudette and Nicole, but on her own, Monet is essentially a near perfect being. All of her physical and mental mental skills are greater than the natural physical limits of peak humans, granting her super strength, speed, agility, stamina, senses, intuition, and a genius level intellect, as well as reflexes that even allow her to catch bullets. She can fly at supersonic speeds by sheer force of will, she can read minds, project her thoughts into the minds of others, and defensively mask her mind against telepathic intrusion. And she has even displayed some telekinesis. And on top of all that, she has the power of being being ridiculously good looking. Lucky. Number four, Marius St. Croix. I could talk about Monet St. Croix for a long time, but her brother, he is just terrifying and needs to be discussed. Marius, who eventually goes by the name M-Plate, has the ability to siphon mutant energy by feeding on the bone marrow of mutants using his super creepy feeder mouths that appear on the palms of his hands. M-Plate needs the energy from mutants in order to survive, almost like a mutant vampire. And like a vampire, if Marius siphons all of a person's energy, his victims will pass away. Also like a vampire, if Mplate drains only part of a victim's energy, he can gain a kind of psychic control over their mind and can cause the mutant to become an energy vampire just like him, but under his control. 
kind of like a vampire's familiar. Interestingly, when feeding from a victim, he actually cancels out their powers and copies them for himself. After multiple feedings, he even gains their power permanently, like he did with Penance's diamond skin. And at number three is Chamber. Chamber, or Jonathan Evans Starsmore, discovered his powers when a blast of psionic energy bursts from his torso, destroying much of his chest and his face. It turns out that Chamber is actually literally composed of that same psionic energy, and his body just acts as a shell for it. When his powers burst out of him, the wound was replaced by a constant glow of psionic fire, leaving him unable to speak. Instead, he can only communicate telepathically. Additionally, he does not eat, drink, or even breathe as he has no organs. Chamber constantly created and unleashed psionic charges of energy that could strike with a volatile force, being projected as a blast from his chest, a series of guided streams that struck specific targets, or as a massive eruption striking in all directions. Now, If he was given the time to train properly, Chamber could have potentially been one of the most powerful mutants to walk the earth, but unfortunately he's not. Number 2. Mikhail Rasputin As the older brother of both Colossus and Magic, Mikhail Rasputin has quite the mutant genealogy, and he ain't no chump himself. Mikhail is an alpha level mutant with the ability to manipulate subatomic matter and warp energy. His power hasn't really been properly defined, but he could forcibly fuse a man to a tree and could manipulate Bobby Drake, Iceman's body. Speaking of Iceman, Mikhail also seemed to display some form of enhanced perception, being able to see Bobby's potential just by looking at him, and he could show him how to use his powers in better ways. Mikhail has also used his power to fire energy blasts, tamper with people's powers, and most prominently for teleportation. He could transport himself as well as others by opening up dimensional portals by ripping away at the subatomic wall of space, which he did when the Soviets sent him into space and blew up his ship. Sorry. And coming in at number one is Sienna Blaze. Sienna Blaze has incredibly strong destructive abilities, thanks to the fact that Sienna can disrupt a planet's electromagnetic energy spectrum, absorbing the energy into her body and then releasing it usually in destructive blasts. Sienna's released energy would tear a hole in the local electromagnetic field, which is bad, in case you wondered, with repeated use of her powers theoretically being able to destroy the planet. She can also use the magnetic energy to fly at 150 miles per hour, or impressively, to teleport herself along the planet's electromagnetic field. Again, every time she teleports, she permanently damages the electromagnetic field at the point of departure, causing a pretty strong explosion. As an example, Sienna shot down the X-Men's Blackbird in Antarctica. Sienna then ambushed Cyclops and Storm and nearly completely took them out until Professor X prevented her from using her powers. Then Storm, Cyclops, and Professor X managed to defeat Sienna, except she just teleported away and left a massive explosion in her stead. Moving on to number 10 with Mero. Of all the mutant powers out there, I think the one I would actively try to avoid having, if that was how it works, is the abilities of Mero. Now, Mero Mero's actual mutant ability is a hyper-accelerated metabolism, and it's through this that she's able to do what most people know her for, accelerated bone growth. She has the ability to control the growth, shape, and toughness of her bone structure, even having it protrude from her body and be used as weapons that she can remove. She can also use this ability to create a sort of armor. Now the only problem, and the reason I wouldn't want it, is that it hurts when she does it. And just imagine how much that would hurt, having your bones protrude protrude from your body? No thank you, I'll, I'll pass. Luckily, she has a very rapid healing factor that also gives her enhanced strength, agility, and reflexes, and as a little bonus, this girl has two hearts, which allowed her to actually survive when she had one pulled out. Nice. Number 9, Eunice the Untouchable. Now, I gotta say the force field abilities of wrestler, criminal, and villain Eunice the Untouchable definitely have some major drawbacks. The positives are great. His force field can withstand blows from the Incredible Hulk. He could project his force field to move objects. He could also use the shield to be untouchable, hence the name, opening it up to be able to grab things and eat. Now, the drawback would come in the fact that there have been multiple times where Eunice had his abilities increased, but to a point he couldn't even control his own abilities. At this time, his shield would literally close him off 
from everything. He couldn't grab things, eat food, or even breathe oxygen, which caused him to even pass out on one occasion, which luckily deactivated his powers, allowing him to actually live. Maybe if he used his powers for good, the writers would make him less self-destructive, but uh, these are the cards you're dealt, bro. Guys, if you are indeed enjoying this video, do make sure to give it a little thumbs up. It's all you gotta do to let us know that you're enjoying what you're seeing. Thanks, nerds. Appreciate you. And at number eight is Pyro. St. John Allardyce is an Australian pyrokinetic mutant. He has the ability to control flame to grow in size and intensity and to even take on any form he desires. He has used flame to create almost solid creations he refers to as, quote, the living flame, which have been in the shape of gigantic claws, birds, or even golems. The size, power, and intensity of the fire beings Pyro created were limited only by the extent of his imagination, the degree of his concentration, and his force of will. The only problem for Pyro is that he cannot generate flames spontaneously. He needs a source, which has been flamethrowers in his costume, other allies like Lockheed, or like a, a lighter or something. He could also be burnt by any fire that wasn't under his direct control. Now, he used his abilities mainly for evil deeds and crimes, but since his resurrection on Krakoa, after he died due to the legacy virus, he has gone on to join Kate Pride's Marauders and got this crazy skull tattoo on his face. It's kind of cool, but also I wouldn't do it, but you know, whatever. Number seven, Strife. You know, a lot of the characters on these lists have come into contact with the character of Strife. And while most people do know how powerful Strife is, I think not including him on this far into this series is kind of a sin. So. Strife is actually a clone, created by Mother Ascani and taken by Apocalypse, a clone of Nathan Summers, whom most of you know as Cable. Strife is essentially what Cable could have been had he not been infected by the techno-organic virus that he needs to use his powers to constantly keep at bay. Without that limitation, just like Cable, Strife is an Omega-level telekinetic, at least that's what he calls himself, and it's stated that he is the third most powerful one on Earth. He is able to do almost all of the other things telepaths of his level are capable of, plus powerful defensive and offensive telekinetic powers. But he is also cybernetically enhanced to have superhuman physical attributes thanks to Apocalypse. Strife is an incredibly powerful villain not to be taken lightly at all. And at number six is Reaper. Pantu Huragev has some interesting abilities to say the least. When he first appeared as part of Strife's Mutant Liberation Front, Reaper had the ability to generate a paralyzing effect on others that slowed their mobility and reaction time. He would usually use his scythe as a conduit for this ability, and it could even fully paralyze victims. But later, Reaper was enhanced by the Weapon X program, who gave him cybernetic prosthetic arms that could take different shapes, although you likely won't be surprised to hear they usually took the form of scythes that would still act as a conduit for his abilities. Unfortunately, Reaper did lose his abilities on M-Day, only to regain them again and then have them drained again. So. He doesn't have any powers right now, I'm pretty sure. Or they're like diluted or something, I don't know. Number five, Dragoness. For Tamara Kurtz, she was born a mutant directly because of the nuclear fallout caused by Hiroshima that her parents were exposed to, which is a different reason than a lot of other mutants, which to me makes her more interesting. She only debuted in 1990, so she's only been around for about 30 years, but she has certainly established herself as a powerful mutant so far, displaying the ability of bioelectricity generation. Kind of like an eel. No, I'm just kidding. She's not like an eel. She usually uses this electricity in electrical blasts and pyrotechnic flares, which she used as part of Strife's Mutant Liberation Front. Since her introduction, she has also been seen as a vampire, after which she died and has since been revived, so she may or may not still be a vampire as well. I have no idea. Also, for a while, she was equipped with these biotechnic pair of wings, which in the House of M were actually completely organic. I'd be stoked to see her show up again in comics and maybe expanded upon. I don't feel like there are many electricity based mutants, so it'd be kind of cool. Number four, Slab. A lot of you liked seeing Thumbelina in part seven of this list, but what about her brother? Chris Anderson was a member of Mr. Sinister's Nasty Boys, and his life before this time isn't very well known. He has abilities similar to his sister. Where she can decrease in size, Slab has been shown to increase in size, getting stronger and more durable as he does so. Later on, he joined the Mutant Liberation Front, and even more recently than that, he has been seen on the Mutant Nation of Krakoa, where he went on to join up with S.W.O.R.D. as part of their security division. Number three, Vincente. He isn't really the most impressive of characters, although his abilities are certainly interesting, even if he usually gets defeated. On Earth-616, Vincente was a member of M-Plate's Hellions team, 
team. He had the ability to change his body from solid, liquid, or gas forms. Now, as a gas or liquid, he has been shown to be able to mix himself in with other materials and substances. So, for example, he once mixed himself in with some soup. Or, in the Age of Apocalypse world, he became wine inside a bottle. Over time, he further developed his abilities so that in his gas form, he could now render himself poisonous if inhaled. He was defeated twice, and since the last defeat, he hasn't really appeared more. Not yet, at least. So let's cross our fingers and hope he shows up. Number two, Skids. Sally Blevins, otherwise known as Skids, has a long history in Marvel Comics, being involved with many other mutant characters and teams from Magneto and Charles Xavier to the Morlocks and X. Terminators. First introduced in X Factor number 7 in August 1986, Skid's mutant ability is to create frictionless force fields that protect her from pretty much all physical attacks, falls, energy weapons, and projections. It can also allow her to kind of skate at a bit of speed given the frictionless nature of these force fields. She can also use her force fields to extend to others if she focuses. There was one really cool moment when she protected Avalon from breaking up upon re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere with help from Jean Grey. That was really cool. So if you ever check that out, Check it out. That made no sense. Whatever. Let's move on. Number one, Wind Dancer. Sofia Mantiga was increasingly isolated at a young age, being ignored by her father, Walter Barrett, after the death of her mother and being told to not use her powers. Now, Sofia finally reached a breaking point. She entered into one of her father's grocery stores and let loose a hurricane inside of it. After she was arrested by police, Mr. Barrett was confronted by Danielle Moonstar, who saw Sofia on the news. She, um, persuaded him to enroll Sophia into the Xavier Institute. Sophia Mantiga has aerokinesis that she uses to amplify small vibrations in the air and draw far off sounds to her ears. She can also disrupt the equilibrium of others with compressed air, lift herself off the ground for flight, create sharp forces of wind that can cut through material, and she even creates isolated whirlwinds or direct blasts of high pressure air control. And she can manipulate the movement of air. But this is all before she was depowered. She has been a part of the Marauders, X Corporation, New Warriors, and New Mutant Squad. Number 10 is Spike. I talked about Marrow in part 8, so it's only fair that I talk about the animated X-Men evolution character known as Spike. Spike, or Evan Daniels, was actually the nephew of Aurora Monroe, but his mutant powers are much different than hers. Similar to Marrow, Evan can manipulate his bones, causing it to project through his skin to create armor and bone spikes that he can use as melee weapons, or he can even launch the spikes from his body as projectiles. Unlike Marrow though, Spike's bones piercing through his skin and being broken off or fired as projectiles doesn't actually hurt him, which is a huge benefit. What's super interesting though is that after some time with the Morlocks, Spike was able to make his bone spikes so hot they were almost on fire, which actually kind of raises more questions that go unanswered than anything else. And at number 9 is Avalanche. You don't often get Greek mutants, which makes Dominic Petros a pretty unique character already. Dominic came from the Greek island of Crete, which is somewhere I desperately want to travel to, so if someone can like hook me up with that, that'd be great, thanks. Like a lot of mutants though, he started out as a villain. Originally part of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, then x Corps, Project Wide Awake, Freedom Force, and Villains for Hire. He's gotten around, and with the destructive capabilities of his powers, it honestly kind of makes sense. Avalanche can create super powerful vibrations waves from his hands. These waves can cause matter to shatter or crumble, and if he uses it on the earth or even large buildings, he can basically create earthquakes or, wait for it, avalanches. But Avalanche has quite the control over this ability, able to move objects, create tidal waves, cause the ground to move or shatter, or even ride waves of earth as transportation. And he even used his abilities to be a fantastic landscaper. If you guys are enjoying this content, I beg of you, slap that thumbs up button. It's the only thing you can do to prove you're loyal to me. I mean, to show your support. Number 8, The Blob. The Blob, or Frederick Dukes, is one of those characters I really didn't give enough credit to when I was growing up. He can actually do some pretty cool things, and some things that didn't even occur to me. His actual main mutant ability, for example, is that he can essentially become immovable by creating a monodirectional increase of gravity beneath him that extends out about 5 feet in radius from his center of balance. But what's even cooler is that with some training, Blob was able to manipulate his gravitational aura 
outwards in order to trigger a localized implosion. Also, the blob is incredibly durable. The fat on the blob is able to absorb the impact of rifle bullets, cannonballs, bazookas, and even torpedoes. He has even been able to survive being hit by a meteorite that was 50 feet in diameter moving at terminal velocity, which is insane. But that's not all. Blob is also able to manipulate his body, basically shape-shifting to a degree. After undergoing the mother vine enhancement process, Blob even developed a secondary mutation, liquid form. And here I thought he was just incredibly fat. Number seven, Caliban. If you have seen Logan, then you'll recognize Caliban as the bald, seemingly albino mutant who hangs out with Logan and Professor X. In that movie, he displays Caliban's main ability, which is being able to detect mutant's X genes, usually within about a 25 mile radius. Although, it's worth noting he has been able to detect particularly powerful mutants from further away before. But what I want to talk about is Caliban's other power that most people don't know. It's called his flight or fight response. So whenever Caliban feels stressed, he manifests two extra powers. Super strength that can overpower Spider Woman and fear absorption. This second power allowed Caliban to absorb the psionic energy created in the fear from others and amplify it back into his environment, doing things like very quickly turning those nearby into a fear-induced panicking mob. This ability was boosted by Apocalypse twice when Caliban served him as both death and pestilence. Number six, Frenzy. Joanna Cargill, like a lot of the X-Men, started off as a villain. She ran away from her home after her mutant powers activated and she caught the passing of her not so great dad in self-defense. From there, she would join Apocalypse's Alliance of Evil, where she would do battle with the X-Men. She would go on to join the Acolytes and eventually the X-Men 2. Now, she works as an agent of S.W.O.R.D. on Abigail Brand's X-Men Red Team. So, with a history like that, she has got to have some cool powers. Well, Frenzy's main power is invulnerability. She possesses steel hard skin, which has only ever been penetrated by adamantium. She's also highly resistant to extreme hot and cold as well as radiation and she can withstand high impact forces like Cyclops's optic beam or a punch from She-Hulk. Speaking of She-Hulk, a byproduct of Frenzy's power is that she has super strength as well. Enough to lift around 25 to 75 tons and punch Jennifer Walters back if she wants to. Number five, Typhoid Mary. Okay, so if you know who the mutant Legion is, the one who has hundreds of different alternate personalities that all have different mutant powers, well, Mary Walker is sort of like that. Only for Mary, she has only a handful of alternate personalities and they just allow her to access the powers that just Mary can't access. Those powers include limited amounts of pyro Telekinesis, telekinesis to move small objects, grabbing her dropped weapons or even turning objects into armor, and telepathy, usually used to manipulate others or influence people to do things without thinking like kissing her or grabbing their weapons. Her Mary persona is a pretty quiet and timid person with no actual powers, but her other main persona is Typhoid, who is more adventurous, lustful, and violent. She later adopted a few other personas like Bloody Mary, who was sadistic and brutal and pretty much hated all men, kind of understandable, sort of, and Mutant Zero, who was a cold, calculated, and militaristic person. Number four, Mask. The Morlock leader, Mask, has a pretty ironic ability. He himself is not exactly the most gorgeous of beings, but his abilities allow him to alter the appearances of others through touch, molding their bodies and features like clay, or just mentally influencing the change he desires. He can alter people's hair and skin color, body structure, and several other features, including turning limbs into tentacles. Mask can also use his powers in combat by making an enemy's limbs attached to their body, like, like, like that, or by closing their breathing orifices to limit their combat prowess. His powers of body manipulation later evolved so that he could alter his own flesh, but the new limits of his powers were stated to be a secondary mutation by Charles Xavier. Apparently, when Mask's body was pierced by Shatterstar's sword, Mask instinctively altered his own internal organs to help him survive, and ever since, he's been able to 
modify his own body. But what he can do exactly in terms of modifying his own body hasn't really been sold yet, so we don't really know. Number three, Christine Cord. Although Christine Cord, now going by Long Strike, doesn't actually have any mutant powers anymore after M Day, she used to actually go by the name Tattoo because her mutant ability was a chameleon skin that allowed Christine to form words or patterns on her skin, which she could use to camouflage herself or convey messages. But she actually has a secondary ability in the form of biophasing. This basically meant that Christine was able to move through matter, and if she reached into another person, which is a terrifying thought, she could disrupt the neurochemistry of a person and or alter their molecular composition. Unfortunately, we won't know what else she could have possibly done because after losing her abilities and joining the new warriors, she unfortunately did not live for too much longer. And at number two is Jeb Lee. Jeb Lee is one of the final horsemen of the mutant Apocalypse. He was chosen as Famine after Apocalypse watched Jeb using his drums at Gettysburg during the Civil War. Now, using his drums made Apocalypse choose Jeb as a horseman? Yes, it did, because Jeb has an incredibly unique mutant ability, which is to transmit a bio-auditory cancer that feeds on the flesh of all who can hear it whenever he makes a tapping noise, whether that be with his drums or even just tapping his fingers on a table. Jeb has a pretty, um, dark past, as you can probably imagine. Lee was a Confederate spy during the United States Civil War, walking the battlefields dressed as a Union soldier. Now, after returning back home, his Union Army uniform was discovered and his family was burned alive, which manifested his mutant powers. He then used these powers to go back to war, marching from battle to battle and taking the life of every human in his trail. And at number one is Dakin. Dakin, or Akihiro, possesses a lot of the same abilities as his father, Wolverine. He has a crazy healing factor, superhuman senses, and of course, bone claws. But what some people may not be aware of is the one mutation he possesses that neither his father nor his sisters possess. That power would be pheromone control. Dakin has empathic ferrokinetic abilities that allow him to use his pheromones to manipulate the emotional state and sensory perceptions of others. He has used this to instill intense fear, happiness, depression, fascination, and a false sense of security in others. The false sense of security though is the definitely most interesting one as it has a allowed him to sneak up on others without them even worrying that he could be there, which is so cool. He has also used this ability to alter others' depth perception and vision, making them fight sluggishly. He can also control his own pheromones to make him basically untrackable, even to someone like Wolverine. Now there are limits to Dakin's pharokinesis, but it is such a cool ability. Number 10, Artie. Arthur Artie Maddox is an interesting one. His mutant abilities manifested when he was just 11 years old, leaving him disfigured and mute. But but granting him the very interesting ability of visual telepathy. This means that Artie can connect to his or others' thoughts, and he can project those thoughts as psionic holograms or pictograms. This is really useful for Artie, uh, specifically as he is a mute, but at the same time, I gotta say, I think that regular telepathy would kind of be a bit more useful, and I don't know. Doesn't matter, because Artie's power is more cool, because he can even make large-scale holograms and use them in battle, usually for defense. But Artie can also also performs something called a mind lock that allows him to paralyze someone physically or mentally. I kind of hope he keeps evolving his powers, but we'll see. Number nine, Ice Scream. Ice Scream, that's I, like this, or scream, like is a villain of the X-Men who decided he needed to destroy the X-Men using their danger room. He actually got pretty far in that plan too, and he was able to overload Cerebro, taking down Professor X temporarily. Now I'm gonna assume he did that by giving the device a brain freeze, because if you hadn't guessed, Ice Cream can turn into any flavor of ice cream. And then everyone screams for Ice Cream's ice cream. No, that's not true, sorry. But using his abilities, he was able to enter the X-Men's mansion and the danger room before Xavier came back too and lowered the temperature in there, freezing Ice Cream's ice cream form, which is when a clown turned him into a banana split and split from the scene. Just go read Obnoxio the Clown from 1983, you'll get it. Make sure you guys check out the other videos in this series and drop a like on this video to show us your support. Number eight, Peeper. 
Peeper, or Peter Quinn, first appeared in Captain America Annual No. 4 in May 1977 as part of Magneto's new Brotherhood. A brotherhood of verbally based villains. Slither, Shocker, Lifter, Burner, and Peeper. Seems like a bit of lazy writing over at Marvel to me, but mm. This group actually went under a couple different names under a couple different leaders, including Mandrill and the Red Skull. Peeper, though, is definitely the most interesting of the bunch, and he's also more relevant as he has appeared recently as part of Abigail Brand's sub team called the Six. On this team, Peeper played the role of the Eye, using his abilities to examine Kyrbon or Kerbon particles. That's because Peeper has the gift of telescopic, microscopic, and X ray vision using his enlarged eyes. But he also had an offensive ability in the form of yellow or red concussive optic blasts. He also seems like a decent dude, despite usually being a villain. Number seven, Brew. Saying that a mutant is unique kind of feels redundant, as most mutants have pretty unique abilities from others of their kind. But Brew is even more unique, as he is not a mutant of the human race. Instead, Brew is a mutant of the incredibly violent and parasitic insectoid alien race known as the Brew D. This essentially means he can actually feel compassion and friendship, and he was born separately from the Brood hive mind, meaning he is not loyal to a Brood. Queen. He also possesses super genius levels of intelligence, making him one of the smartest students at Jean Grey's school for higher learning. So, Brew's X gene mutation is only really mental or psychological in nature, but being a brood, he brings natural body armor and fanged jaws to a fight. And recently, Brew actually consumed a king egg, making him king of the entire brood species, including the brood queens. Number six, Big Bertha. Bertha Crawford, originally Ashley Crawford, until she changed her name, had the mutant ability of total control over her body's physical size and mass. She can add or take away hundreds of pounds to herself at will, controlling her figure. This allowed her to become the highest paid fashion model in America at one point, but also allowed her to don the Big Bertha superhero persona. Using her abilities to add bulk and mass, she actually increases her durability and her strength to a peak of lifting 50 tons, allowing her to jump huge distances like the Hulk. No matter what size Bertha alters herself to though, she has a high level of athleticism. Ashley rebranded branded herself into a plus size model, which is when she changed her name to Bertha. And you know what? She still kind of killed it. Good job. Number five, Decimus Furious. Decimus Furious actually began his life all the way back in ancient Rome, where his mother and father took their own lives, leaving Decimus homeless on the streets. In 281 AD, on the cusp of the afterlife due to his hunger, his mutant powers activated. This gave him super strength and durability, alongside an extremely bestial form, similar to like a minotaur, but almost as if it was made of stone. He's really super cool looking, honestly. But his his more powerful ability would be empathic war infection. This basically means that Decimus can infect anyone who he strikes with a thirst for war, which will send them into a rage filled state. It also acts as a defensive tool against telepaths who try to read or control his mind, causing the war infection to overcome the telepath. He has also been shown to be able to piece himself back together after being blown up, which is funny because he blew up when Phantom X made him feel love, which did not compute, and he just went boom. He became Apocalypse's final horseman of war. Number four, Warpath. James Proudstar is the younger brother of John Proudstar, also known as Thunderbird. And he always idolized his brother, but in that idolization, he actually limited his own powers to a degree. Mostly, his mutation boosts up his physical capabilities, granting him super strength that has had various different levels. Once having Hulk levels of strength, but another time struggling to fight an alligator. He can run at 100 miles per hour, and his stamina allows him to exert himself for 24 hours without rest. He can withstand a hell of a lot more than a regular human, like falling several stories or being hit with energy. Blasts. His agility and reflexes are increased to the point of dodging bullets, and his senses allow him to see in the dark and hear sounds other humans can't. After some training with Pete Wisdom, Warpath has shown the ability of self propelled flight and a regenerative healing factor. What's really interesting is that while working with Ghost Rider, James gained shamanistic abilities like perceiving spirit energy. He's also probably one of the best mutant combatants, whether it's unarmed or armed, with his vibranium daggers. Number 
three. Gideon. I believe Gideon here is the first external to make this list. The externals include immortal mutants like Selene and Apocalypse, but they all share a psychic link which separates them from other immortal characters. Gideon was born during the 15th century and aboard Christopher Columbus's first expedition, he actually succumbed to scurvy and his life was changed forever when he resurrected and gained his mutant abilities. Like all externals, Gideon is immortal and no longer ages. He can also resurrect himself, as confusing as that sounds since he's immortal. But unique to him is the ability of power mimicry, giving himself the powers, advanced skills, and talents of any being, android, or even battle suit. And he's been able to gain the powers of three people at once. But more than that, his powers allow him to fully understand how to use that other person's powers to the point that he can even overcome the original user of said power. Number two, Cypher. Cypher, or Doug Ramsey, has omnilingual translation abilities. And considering that communication is an essential part of our everyday lives, whether that be with other humans, devices, or even our own selves, I'd say he's pretty powerful. He can translate language of literally any origin, even alien. He can read and decipher codes, including computer code, as well as read body language, subtext, and unspoken intention. More recently, everything he sees is interpreted as information, meaning he basically kind of just reads life. He can read body language to the extent he is able to predict people's moves before they make them. He can learn and perform spells for magic users, and he even created his own overly complex language that makes him immune to psychic mind reading. But Doug actually merged with Warlock, essentially giving Doug techno-organic shapeshifting abilities on top of everything else. And for our number one spot, we are going to talk about my number Number one favorite X Men, Nightcrawler. Kurt Wagner was first introduced in Giant Size X Men number one in April 1975 with the immutant ability to biophysically displace himself into the brimstone dimension, travel through it with a subconscious sense, and then return back to our dimension in a different location, essentially teleporting. This all happens so fast it's almost instant and it always is accompanied by the signature BAMF sound. Although he can teleport really really far, even across the world more recently, he avoids teleporting to places he hasn't been before or places he can't see as he can accidentally end up appearing within solid matter which could potentially end his life. Although he does have a small amount of spatial awareness that at least keeps his feet from teleporting into the ground. and he can can even use the little demon things known as BAMPs as teleportation beacons that allow for teleportation to places he hasn't been before, even across dimensions. Through his unique physiology, he gains a few extra abilities as well, like a prehensile tail, microsuction hands and feet, and flexible bone structure, but he can also camouflage himself, bending light using the brimstone dimension. But what a few might not know is that he actually became immortal thanks to the fact that recently, he sacrificed his soul in heaven to come back to life, which is good because I never want to lose this legendary blue mutant.